Good afternoon and welcome. Today is March 2nd, 2023, and this is the bill hearings for the Ways and Means Committee. First, we are going to call House Bill 708, uh, the Speaker's Bill, by request of the Comptroller, and we will ask our Comptroller to come up. Welcome. Yes. Uh, Madam Chair, Madam Vice Chair, it's nice sound, Madam, Madam. Uh, members of the committee, um, uh, thank you so much for giving me some time today to discuss House Bill 708. So this bill is not about uh, my office, it's a bill about fairness. Um, and as many of you know, um, for the past two years I've pledged to be an advocate for people um, and that the office would provide outstanding customer service to all Marylanders and that our tax administration would be responsive, transparent, and fair. And this bill is really about that third leg, tax fairness. This bill corrects an issue with unemployment, unemployment insurance benefits. Um, so Marylanders who applied in 2020 or 2021 um, and did not receive their benefit payments until 2022 were penalized by having to pay taxes on those benefits. If they would have received them in 2020 or 2021, like on time, because of the Relief Act that we passed several years ago, they would not have had to pay taxes on those benefits. And actually, the origin of this bill goes back to when I was in the House, um, because one of my constituents reached out to me, um, and he's actually submitted testimony, and he called my office in mid-2022, and uh, as I'm sure many people who were seeking their unemployment benefits called all of your offices, um, because his payments had unexpectedly stopped coming in 2021, and he wanted to know what he could do about it. Um, so after a few phone calls, we were able to reinstate his payments, um, and he received his... You guys... Can you put it down? Thanks. Um, and he received his payments again. Um, and they restarted, but they restarted in 2022, despite being approved in 2021 for them. And that meant that they were no longer tax exempt under the provisions of the Relief Act. Instead, they were taxed at 7%. Um, so after speaking further with the Department of Labor, we realized that there were thousands of these folks. You and I know, you remember the calls, people desperate for their unemployment benefits. They applied as they were supposed to in 2020 and 2021. And we passed the Relief Act to make sure that those individuals wouldn't have those benefits taxed in 2020 and 21, so they'd keep that extra income. However, so many Marylanders didn't receive those benefits until 2022. Uh, in fact, we think maybe 80,000 Marylanders didn't receive those benefits until 2022. So those Marylanders were effectively denied about $250 a person. Um, because that's sort of the average of what it would have been um, in terms of the taxes. So Marylanders were actually hit twice by, by their states, once when their initial claim was delayed, and then again when they lost the tax benefit that they qualified for. Um, so the Relief Act exempted those unemployment insurance payments, but only if they were paid out in 2020 or 21. So this bill creates a one-time rebate. It's um, for Marylanders who are struggling with the effects of inflation or working to rebound from being unemployed. It sends them back that money that they would not have had to pay, but for the Department of Labor um, not being able to meet their unemployment benefits, uh, get their unemployment benefits on time. So as a delegate, I was very proud to support the Relief Act, and as Comptroller, I'm here today to make sure that the tax relief that we envisioned for people like my constituent ends up in the pocket of all Marylanders who deserve it. And while it's too late to undo the harm that was caused by delays in the Department of Labor, this bill will make a meaningful difference to the unemployed workers that experienced those delays and keep the promises that we made when we passed the Relief Act. I urge a favorable report on HB 708. Thank you. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, Madam Vice Chair, and members of the House Ways and Means Committee. It is a pleasure to be here today advocating for Maryland residents. My name is Giovante Hawkins. I'm the Executive Director of the Maryland Society of Accounting and Tax Professionals. Our 2,000 CPAs and tax professional members represent more than 700,000 Maryland residents. The Maryland Society of Accounting and Tax Professionals supports House Bill 708. The purpose of the Relief Act 
was to provide economic re relief to individuals and businesses affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. The delays in the Maryland Department of Labor were outside of the control of the individuals receiving unemployment benefits, and it is unfair to penalize these individuals by requiring them to pay taxes on benefits that were earned in the previous tax year, but not received until the following year. These individuals who received unemployment benefits are required to pay taxes on those benefits for a year, for a tax year in which they did not receive the benefit. In that case, this could offset some of all, or all of their relief provided by the act, particularly for individuals who were in dire financial straits due to the pandemic. A rebate, rebate program to refund the taxes on paid, I'm sorry, to refund the taxes paid on unemployment benefits received in 2022 would bring these individuals into parity with the other taxpayers whose benefits were both earned and paid during the time frame envisioned by the Relief Act. This would help to ensure that all individuals receiving unemployment benefits are treated fairly and receive the intended relief from the Act. We applaud the Maryland Legislature for acknowledging how the above reference performance affected Maryland residents, and while the solution proposed does not make whole those who were adversely affected during a difficult time, we find the proposed solution a creative way to attempt to right a wrong. We urge a favorable report on HB 708. Uh Thank you, Chair Atterbury, Vice Chair Wilkins, and members of the committee. My name is Callie Schumitz. I'm with the Maryland Center on Economic Policy. And we are in strong support of House Bill 708 uh, because one of our top priorities is making Maryland's tax system more equitable. HB 708 is a straightforward, common sense bill that restores a tax benefit that some workers who went through a period of unemployment missed out on through no fault of their own. Uh, this committee and the General Assembly did the right thing in 2021 when you decided to uh, ex exempt uninsurance, uh, unemployment insurance payments from the state income tax given the extraordinary circumstances that were taking place at the start of the pandemic. However, as you all well know, um, there were massive administrative challenges that left some workers waiting months for the benefits that they were owed and desperately needed. Uh, then those who had to wait until 2022 to receive their payments were not eligible for the R Relief Act tax benefit that you all intended them to have. While it is too late to undo the months of hardship and an anxiety that unemployed workers faced as they waited for delayed benefits, uh, HB 708 would make a meaningful difference for workers by restoring the tax benefits that they lost. Um, and then uh, the final point I'll make, um, as we often say uh, in this committee, um, when you're giving rebates and cash back to low and moderate income households who would benefit from this, they are very likely to immediately spend that money on necessities at local businesses. So it does also benefit um, those businesses and our, our economy. So for those reasons, we'd ask for a favorable report on House Bill 708. Thank you. Madam Chair, members of the Ways and Means Committee, my name is Robin McKinney. I'm the co-founder and CEO of the Cash Campaign of Maryland. Cash stands for Creating Asset Savings and Hope, and we promote economic advancement for low to moderate income individuals and families in Baltimore City and across the state of Maryland. More than half of our clients earn less than $20,000, with many earning less than $10,000. This bill will ensure that UI claimants that applied for benefits in 20 and 21, but received them in 2022, will still receive the tax exemption granted in the Relief Act. As um, the largest free tax preparation provider in the state, we are getting a lot of questions about this at our tax sites. People are really worried about um, what additional money they're gonna owe because obviously they need every single dollar that's coming into their pockets. Unemployment protects families by supplementing a part of their income when they are unemployed due to no far of their own, but it also ensures that they have basic necessities like food, housing, and it helps them to reconnect to the, refor uh, to the workforce by combating barriers like affording transportation and childcare. This money is gonna be spent in our local communities. People need the money now. The unprecedented effect that the economy had um, when you all passed the Relief Act led to you all making the right decision in 2021. So we're asking you to please make the right decision again. Uh, the delay in people running uh, that you all saw in, with all of your constituents was through no fault of their own. People were following all the rules and their payments were just not paid out on time. And so with this, we'll be able to, again, not remove every single hardship that they have, but to, to right that initial wrong. So with that, we urge a favorable report for House Bill 708. Thank you. Any questions from the committee? Delegate Barnes. 
Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, uh, Madam Comptroller, for presenting the bill. As I read through this, and, and I understand it, because my office is still getting phone calls from uh, those that have been impacted by uh, COVID, as well as those that have not even received uh, their, mm -hmm. their funding. Mm -hmm. Is there a number as to how many people we're looking for this to be able to help? And what would be the offset or the uh, relief dollar amount? Great question. So we know that 21,474 people applied in 2020 and did not get their payments until 2022. And we know that 59,059 people applied in 2021 and did not get their unemployment payments until 2022. So we're talking about 80,000 people, basically, um, which is pretty staggering. I mean, it's, you know, we, I know we all handled their phone calls um, and it was a really trying time. Um, and we know that it would be, um, we, we've calculated up that it would be $11 million, we know for sure, based on state taxes that have been withheld by the Department of Labor, but we estimate it would be an, probably another five to nine above that as well um, in non-withheld taxes. Um, that is our estimate. So it is a sizable so amount we're, we're, so of we're dollars and people. Roughly $20 million to rewrite a wrong, if mm -hmm. you will. Uh, and do we have an idea as to the uh, where these people coming from? As they're, far, uh, they're all over the they're state. They're all over the state. They're all right over now? the state. Yep. Okay. Yep. They're all over the state. And um, I think there's written testimony from AERP. Um, and I did want to just highlight that because when we talk about where are these people coming from, there are also a lot of seniors. Um, who this affected as well, um, who became unemployed during, um, during the pandemic um, and could not get through. So there's a, a higher number of seniors than one would guess. All right. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mm -hmm. Delegate Hornberger. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Controller, good to see you. Okay. Um, I just had two questions on the bill, and I, I think it's great, um, the bill, just to start with. But um, is there a hold harmless uh, for the people that potentially overpaid and filed and then received a re accordingly return? There isn't a hold harmless written into the bill. I mean, we could look into, I mean, we could edit, you know, we could amend it. Um, but I don't know, I don't know how many we have actually, I can, we can go back and look and see if that has happened or how much, the pre what the prevalence of that is. I don't know if you all are seeing, if you've seen that at all at cash, but, yeah, but we, we can certainly amend. We've had a number of constituents, this is more from the labor side, a number of constituents that um, received benefit and then were told later that they shouldn't have, that they needed to pay it back. Right. So this has some tax implications on the kind of the same vein. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> and then That's the, true. the second question is, uh, we also saw a tremendous amount of fraud that occurred during this. So yes. is there a protocol to make sure that these are bona fide applicants? Yes. So um, that is a good question. Um, a lot of... So the Department of Labor um, has wor is working through that. So from our standpoint, um, we have very good, uh, I like to brag, we have excellent fraud detection in the Comptroller's office. We are always looking to beef it up, but we um, are doing really good work there. Um, and these numbers, these people are people who've been verified. They are accurate. The Department of Labor paid them, understands who they are, and, and, um, and so we also have verified them as well. Okay, great. Thanks for the yep. Um, just on the overpayment uh, issue, there is a bill that um, Economic Matters okay. is considering, um, and we'd be happy to connect you on that. Okay, there you Thank go. You. Thanks. Any further questions from the committee? Okay, seeing none, thank you very much. Thank you. Always great to see you, Madam Comptroller. You too. And that concludes the testimony on House Bill 708. Delegate Munoz, House Bill 1094. Thank you so much. Um, thank you. It's so lovely to see the Ways and Means Committee. Um, for people who were not here last year, I want to let you know that I really enjoyed my one whole month being on this committee before actual session began. <laughs> and then I was moved to judiciary. So it's lovely to be here for the first time ever. 
Um, I am here just to present HB 1094, and some of you might think this is an odd bill to bring before you, but every bill I've brought this session is actually from a constituent, and this one in particular is from someone very dear to me, um, my son Logan, who's a little 10-year-old boy. Um, Logan would really appreciate it as he is getting allowance and starting to go shopping himself um, that he could calculate how much he needed to pay at Five Below and Franklin's Toys um, at the 5% level rather than 6 because it's easier for him to do the math. <laughs> also for me, I'm an attorney, so math is like not my, my jam. But it was an interesting, interesting request, and I looked into it given everything Marylanders have experienced um, through COVID-19, the inflation, the labor shortage, uh, the supply chain issues we're currently having, and I dug into it a little bit, and I realized that it's Marylanders all across the state that are struggling to make ends meet and to afford the things that they need for their families, and if we did, by some miracle, reduce Maryland sales tax from six to 5%, um, we may actually see an increase in revenue because families who are currently, you know, tightening their purses, not purchasing, you know, the things they used to like ice cream, the little luxuries that, you know, so many of us enjoy and we take for granted that other people can't, um, it's possible that with a lower sales tax, we would see more of those people out and about and able to afford the things that they want and need for their families. Um, it's really a very simple bill. Um, I know you can read the fiscal note and, and again, that's based on you know, what people are currently spending and what they're currently buying on. But we've seen families you know, talking online you know, in our neighborhoods about eggs. They can't purchase eggs for their children uh, because they're so expensive right now. So, with that, I'm happy to take any questions, and I just humbly you know, request that you consider this bill uh, with a kind heart, and uh, I'll turn it over to my guest. Okay, well, thank you all for having me. My name is Europe C. Morgan. Um, I am also an attorney. A significant part of my practice is focused on estate planning and probate. Um, some of the saddest stories that I hear are when I uh, write somebody's will, and one of the first questions they'll ask me is, is this will still valid if I move or when I move to Florida or to Pennsylvania or to Virginia? And oftentimes it's grandparents that ask me that question simply because of the cost of living here in Maryland. Um, over the years as my practice has grown, I have um, heard that question now from a lot of different people, including young adults, parents who are simply finding that the cost of living in Maryland is simply too expensive for them. And so I support this bill, and I urge you to consider it as well, not just because of the people that it affects, but because of the numbers as well. For example, our neighbor, Delaware, has a 0% sales tax, as I'm sure we all know. Um, if you may not have been aware that if a person from Annapolis were to move to Delaware City on a salary of $60,000, their cost of living would be lowered by 13.4%. In addition, they would have a positive net change of disposable income of $7,443.80. That's huge. In addition, it's good for the businesses in Maryland. Businesses, of course, are made of people. They're a reflection of the community that we serve. Retailers in Maryland could benefit from an increase in sales resulting from a decrease in the sales and use tax. As a point of reference, according to the fiscal and policy note, a 0.94% increase in general taxable sales would result in approximately $9,400 in recouped sales for a business. In terms of state revenue, we know that we have a $2 billion surplus that was announced by the former comptroller. According to Maryland Matters, that big part of that windfall was from a 19.6% increase in sales. I'm asking you to please invest in your neighbors, invest in Marylanders. As you heard the current comptroller talk about a $250 impact and what that would be in, the state, in an individual's budget. Imagine how impactful that would be on the people of Maryland if the sales tax were to be lowered simply by 1%. The state would recoup that money in increased sales, and it would make a huge impact on our neighbors. Thank you. Are there any questions from the committee? Delegate Wu. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I want to make it a little light. So, Delegate, thanks for bringing the bill. 
actually have an advice for your son to calculate 6%, it's not easy. So first calculate 5% plus 1%, that would be easier. Thank you so much, <laughs> Delegate. <laughs> delegate Hornberger. Uh, thank you, and this, this question is either for the delegate or the congresswoman. Um, in terms of sales tax, sales tax is most punitive for low income and poor. Um, in terms of the, everything that they purchase, they're, they're, they're assessed at the same amount of tax rate as someone who's high income. So could you just go into a little bit of how this would actually help you know, poor and working class families? Sure, so as we know, the sales tax is a regressive sales tax, so the impact is felt more heavily on people with lower income, um, which is why, as we sit here and talk about, uh, as, a, as a comptroller um, identified ways to help people, especially those who are low income, $250 would make a huge impact. So if you're talking about a situation in which a family is on a fixed income and they're having to go out and buy eggs at the grocery store, and I'll just tell you from my own perspective, I have a daughter who does competi uh, competitive gymnastics, this child eats four egg whites a day, four hard-boiled egg whites a day. You should all pray for my budget. It is expensive. But on a regular basis, as we know, when we lower the sales tech, it enables people directly to make those decisions in their own homes, their own budgets, as to what they can and can't afford. Right now, Marylanders are barely struggling to make ends meet. A, a lowering the sales tax would actually enable those people to stretch their budgets further, spend more money here at home, and thereby increase the state budget, which would have a huge impact on individual families, but also increasing, in all likelihood, the state budget, which would be a win for everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Delegate Long. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I like this, Bill. I had something similar to this, but mine was indexed to the inflation rate. Um, think about, I think I might have said this during my bill uh, hearing, you know, inflation is probably 7 or 8 percent. I'm being conservative. So now we're paying sales tax not only on, um, you know, the inflative rate, we're, we're paying uh, more taxes because of the inflated rate. And I agree with you, eggs are outrageous. Uh, we're going to hide potatoes this year. I think I said that during my bill hearing because eggs are so expensive. Uh, but this is a great bill. I'd like to see it passed. I mean, it's a good conversation. One of the things I'd like to find out, if somebody could find out what the difference would be if we did lower the sales to, to 5% to what, the, what we brought in as far as revenue last year. I mean, you know, with inflation, it seems like to me it would be a win-win situation. Yes, well, I can tell you, um, Delegate, that uh, the uh, part of the $2 billion um, surplus that the state uh, has is partly due to a 19.6% um, increase in sales tax revenue right. because, in all likelihood, of inflation, which is why when we start to do the math and we realize that at 6%, people can spend less. At 5%, people can spend more on the things that they need, particularly those low-income individuals, which in all likelihood would, uh, we would see more of a balancing effect on the state budget. Which is why, as I was saying, this is something that helps low-income Marylanders, all Marylanders in general, um, but also the state budget to continue to be as healthy as it has been. Well, thank you. Any other questions from the committee? Okay, seeing none, thank you, Delegate Munoz. Thank you. And that concludes the testimony on House Bill 1094. And Delegate Alston was here, and she just stepped out of the room. So I'm going to call Madam Vice Chair. Okay. Is that okay? House Bill 802, Madam Vice Chair. Hello, Madam Chair. Greetings to this esteemed committee. For the record, I am Delegate Janelle Wilkins, and I'm pleased to present HB 802. HB 802 deals with the fact that our Maryland universities should not encourage the targeting of our students by making money from students' engagement in sports betting. It's important that we have protections in place from targeting students and not exploiting students for profit. HB 802 prohibits a Maryland higher in education institution from entering into a contract with a gaming entity 
or an agent of a gaming entity if the contract specifically says that it gives a commission, bonus, or incentive based on student participation in sports betting. It also creates transparency under the Public Information Act for these types of contracts with gaming entities. I urge a favorable report on HB 802. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. Are there any questions? Okay, seeing none, thank you very much. And that concludes the testimony on House Bill 802. Thank you. Calling Delegate Rose, House Bill 936. Welcome back. Great to be here again. Again, I still miss you, even from yesterday. Um, Delegate April Rose here today to present House Bill 936. Um, this bill um, I had last year, and so um, I'm not going to read my testimony. However, as we all know, uh, cybersecurity attacks on businesses, nonprofits, governments has been an ongoing problem. And so a lot of times a small business will not um, take the measures of implementing a cybersecurity plan because of the cost. And so this bill would provide a tax credit um, of 500, well, originally at $1,000 for initial assessment and then $500 per year because that industry um, of cyber attacks changes constantly and they're constantly upping their uh, crafty ways of tricking businesses uh, into falling into a lot of the different traps. And so um, it's, it, this is truly an opportunity for where an ounce of prevention equals a ton of cure. Uh, it's been estimated that if you end up with a ransomware attack or some other cybersecurity attack, it could cost a business of any size anywhere from a six-figure amount of damage or more. And so the intent of this bill is to encourage our smallest businesses to implement some sort of uh, way to get ahead of these problems and then to have an opportunity to take care of them on an ongoing basis. Um, I did originally say 1,500. I did draft an amendment due to the fiscal note of we could drop it to 500 and maybe 250. I'm open to working with the committee on what that right number would be and uh, happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions for Delegate Rose? Delegate Fair. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for bringing this bill forward, Delegate. Um, I did want to ask about the definition of cybersecurity inside of here because, mm -hmm. um, as I'm sure you're aware, cybersecurity can, can cover a lot of different items, yes. both physical and obviously cloud-based information, mm -hmm. servers, even cameras, right. does, this, does this encompass everything inside of cybersecurity for the assessment and for the uh, measures undertaken? My intent was for it to be, um, you know, based on the business. As you mentioned, some businesses are more, you know, video teleconference based, camera based, um, but then there's also just your general, you know, uh, server emails. So we have a lot of different kinds of businesses. Um, if the committee would want to define it further, um, but I think by leaving it broad, it opens it up to businesses of any type to tailor it to what their needs would be. Um, and you know, truthfully, uh, cyber it could be there. There, the, the tricky things that are done. It could be a receptionist clicks on an email. It looks almost exactly like what it should. Yep. There could be a you're not paying that close of attention, and there could be one letter off in a, in the name. And if you don't catch it, you click on that button. It could open you up to all sorts of of issues and problems. I would love to talk to you offline about this bill. Just at, there's so many layers to cybersecurity that can Absolutely. be taken, and I think cybersecurity companies would be the first to tell you that a lot of times they make recommendations for businesses that they don't yes. implement. So I'm wondering if there's a way to incentivize businesses to take extra steps in this process that would better protect them and not leave them open for security risk. Absolutely, and that's exactly why I wanted to have the ongoing tax credit because you can do the initial assessment feel that you have a pretty good safety net, but 
as we get better at protecting ourselves, these bad actors are finding other ways to get around it. And so that's why I think an ongoing tax credit is really important so that businesses will have the incentive to continue to upgrade their security practices. It could be as simple as uh, one year training every year, have everybody that's an employee go through a very simple training. These are the latest trends, this is what's going on. A one year training might not cost a whole lot of money but it's worth doing because if you have that one person that makes you know, really an innocent mistake based on bad actors, it could be very catastrophic. Thank you. Delegate Buckle. Thank you, Madam Chair. So you know, in your years on the committee, we've, we've tried to, to facilitate this bill because everybody thinks it's a good intention and purpose. And one of the reasons that it gets stuck always becomes the fiscal note. Right. So my recollection in, in looking at the fiscal note is the, the uh, cybersecurity credit that exists now that's typically eaten up by larger companies, larger businesses is capped at $4 million. Do you think that it might be possible to facilitate the goals of this bill? Because, you know, I don't always believe in the, in the fiscal analysis. I'm not saying that, that I, I, I think know. they're doing something wrong. I just think that it's not really uh, as accurate or econometric as we would like to see, right. given the realities. But it says, you know, it may exceed $70 million in state revenue. So, you know, you know we're not going to do that. You're, you served right. on the committee long enough. Would you be amenable to perhaps capping this credit for the small business at a fractional amount, a million, two million, two and a half million dollars of what we cap the large business or the, the open-ended cybersecurity tax credit, which is four million? Absolutely. I think that would be very reasonable. And... Uh, in addition to what you mentioned about the fiscal note, as I read it, it makes a lot of assumptions. While we make this tax credit available, it's making assumption of how many businesses would actually avail themselves to it, and that's a question. Um, so I think that would be a great idea, and I would certainly be open to doing that. Okay, you cap it, you get an ob absolute budgetary impact. Mm -hmm. You know what it's going to cost and what it's Absolutely. not going to cost. And, okay, thank you. Great idea. Thank you. He has one from time to time. <laughs> Any further questions from the committee? Okay, seeing none, thank you, Delegate Rose. Thank you all. Bye. Okay, and that concludes the testimony on House Bill 936. Delegate Fisher, House Bill 1169. Well, good afternoon, esteemed members of the House Ways and Means Committee. For the record, my name is Delegate Mark Fisher, District 27C, beautiful Calvert County, Maryland. I'm going to start out with House Bill 1169. It's titled Sales and Use Tax, Precious Metal Bullion or Coins. This is a really simple bill, which says that if you're buying gold and silver coins or bullion, not jewelry, but just coins or bullion, that it's exempt from the sales tax. Uh, it's my understanding that if you buy over $1,000 worth, you are charged the sales tax in Maryland, but under $1,000, you are not charged, excuse me, but if you, if you buy under 1000 you are charged. So it seems kind of unfair. Um, especially in times of inflation, when uh, by holding on to dollars, you're actually losing money. So there's an opportunity to kind of fix that so that people can invest in, in uh, hard assets and that will hopefully hold their value, because we know the dollar isn't. And that's what the bill does. Happy to answer any questions. I have a question. Of course. What's a bullion? Uh, it's, instead of a coin that's been, that's been coined, if you will, a it's coin a, that's been coined? It's, <laughs> it's an ingot. It's like an ingot. A who? It's like a block of it's a, Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So instead of being minted like a coin, it's an ingot. So An ingot. You coming yeah. in here with all types of SAT words today. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Hey, my wife, my wife was born in Switzerland, okay? I know okay. a little bit about this stuff. So. Delegate Buckle has some questions for you. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair. I just had a question that, that seemed of what you just said, and I just took the first look at the bill. Why in the world, do you have any idea, did, did you get any chance to, I don't know, research maybe is the right word, why would we not impose a sales tax for people who are buying a lot of this, which would tend to me that they're wealthier individuals typically using it to hedge their investment portfolios. They don't pay any tax. But people that are buying less than $1,000 of it that may be for, for particularized purposes or maybe they're middle class folks who just want to buy in small increments, they are paying a sales tax. you have any idea? Like that, that is completely counterintuitive. 
It is. I think the history, um, the history of this, we've looked into. We haven't been able to find how it got to this point, but clearly it, the the current law skews towards those with money, uh, and against those that do not have it. Right. And so it would make sense to fix that. And maybe, Madam uh, Madam Chairwoman, we could have a, a zero fiscal note by fixing that. Right. By leveraging out, you're going to yes. charge the sales tax on the larger purchases, maybe even thousands, not realistic now with the price of gold, but you're not going to charge it for people who are just buying smaller amounts as part of their retirement savings on a monthly basis. So for example, if you buy an ounce of, uh, if you buy a coin, and it's a gold coin, and it's one ounce, it's worth almost $2,000. Um, so you're paying the sales tax. You're not paying the sales tax on that. I don't know very many people who are working people, they're going to buy a $2,000 coin. They're right. probably going to buy the silver coin, which is 25 bucks. But you might get people who say, hey, I decided as part of my investment thing, I invest 250 bucks a month in silver bullion that I think is a hedge against inflation, and I pay the sales tax on my $250 a month purchase. Perfect. Okay. Exactly. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you. Seeing thank none, you. that concludes the testimony on House Bill 1169. House Bill 1184, is that you? Or? It is. Okay. It is. And again, for the record, Delegate Mark Fisher... On behalf of the Calvert County delegation, House Bill 1184 is entitled the Calvert County State Emissions and Amusement Tax, Electronic Bingo, and Tip Jars Distribution and Tax Rate. Uh, the bill increases the state admissions and amusement tax rate imposed on electronic bingo or electronic tip jars in Calvert County from 33% to 35%. It directs the revenue of 2% more for parks and rec recreation capital projects or park improvement projects in Calvert County. Folks, there's a lot more actually to this bill than what you're reading. Um, so when I was first elected, <laughs> my, uh, my suite mate, if you will, in the United States, in the Senate, excuse me, I wish in the United States Senate, in the Senate across, in the, Senate across the hallway was Senator Miller. So I've been in his district since I've been elected. And, um, Hard to believe, but long before Maryland had legalized gambling, in Chesapeake Beach, we had, and we have, slot machines. And the gentleman, they were gone for years, and the gentleman who put them in, Chesapeake Beach, the first gentleman, just decided to do it because he found a loophole in the law that had not been obviously corrected for many years, and put them in in the 90s. The county commissioners of Calvert County sued um, and said, look, you, you can't do that. It's not legal, and you need to have some sort of referendum locally. And remember, the state didn't have gambling. Senator Miller um, had, for many years, lobbied for gambling, primarily in Prince George's County. That's where he wanted it. Um, and there was this big dust-up with Ehrlich and so forth and, and other governors in the past. And a struggle, as you can imagine, because there was so much money involved. Um, so, Senator Miller was very angry at this individual in Chesapeake Beach, and so what he did was, is he attached this tax that you currently see that is there, I think it's 33%, and the money goes to the state. Meaning that we are the only county in the entire state that has gambling, which now has been normalized and legalized, including in our county, but just in three little businesses in Chesapeake Beach, and we get nothing, nothing. So I have asked George Butler um, if he wouldn't mind, you know, providing to, to you folks um, what the difference is with the pull tab bingo machines in Anne Arundel County and with the, in terms of what Anne Arundel County gets versus what Calvary County gets, not the state, but the counties. I can tell you it's in the many, 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 many millions of dollars that Anne Arundel County gets versus what Calvary County gets. Um, interestingly enough, for those of you who, who care, um, the reason why there was gambling to begin with many years ago in the 50s in Southern Maryland is because it was Las Vegas. And um, the church groups came to this legislature and said, we don't want this anymore because people are losing their houses. Gambling disappeared from the state for many, many years. One of the individuals who had a gambling place in southern Anne Arundel, and that place is still there with pull tab bingo machines, was a young Steve Wynn. And so 
this industry is rich in the state. Um, there's been a struggle for many years, and you all know this on this committee better than anyone else, the struggle for money by the casino owners and the state. And I'm only going along on this, uh, Madam Chairwoman, because we literally get nothing. If you look at the fiscal note, it says, well, there is a Calvert County Youth and Opportunities Recreational Fund. Again, you know, glasses would help. But the thing is, that money goes to the state. And my county has to come and beg for it. So we don't even get it. The truth is, we get zero. So we have to provide, and the local governments, the town of Chesapeake Beach and the town of North Beach, which are literally right next to each other on the Chesapeake Bay, North Beach doesn't have gambling, but they get the spillover of some issues. And between the two towns, um, they have to fund the police so they have to hire like local sheriffs in Calvert to pay for all that. And um, it's gotten to the point where this has occurred for so long that we haven't gotten anything. The county commissioners are just asking for parity. In this bill, it doesn't even do that. This bill's just increasing the tax rate to the maximum to 35% and asking for that money to be redirected for county parks. Truth is, truth is, the county would love to be treated the same way as Anne Arundel County and every other county. Um, but we know that that's a hard lift because my understanding is that revenues are coming in way below what they should be from the comptroller. And so it's hard to come before your committee and, and ask for fairness. Um, but I'm trying to correct something, and it was a person, again, this was a personality conflict between the former state Senate president, the longest state president serving in history of the United States, and a local businessman over gambling. I'm happy to answer any questions. I, I have a quick question. Yes, ma'am. So does the county not, the county does not have the authority to impose some sort of tax on do, its own? We do not. Okay. We do not. You would think, right? Um, that was part of the bill that passed years ago. Um, by Senator Miller. It was the state taxed to 33%, took all 33%, and said we're going to put this tiny little amount in this Youth Recreational Opportunities Fund at the state level, and then we have to apply for it. And so we get zero. Okay. Delegate <laughs> Buckle. Thank you, Madam Chair. So, yeah, I mean, that's really, you know, I, I live in a county that has a casino, and we get, I want to say four, four to five million dollars a year with the smallest casino in the state because of the local impact grant formula where you get a percentage of the VLT money and then five percent of all of the table game money goes into the to the local impact grant uh, fund formulas. So it's certainly kind of strange and not right that Calvert County hosts similar, not casinos, but similar places and gets gets basically nothing. Would you have a philosophical objection, because I know that you, like me, don't enjoy raising people's taxes and taking more money out of the private sector and into the business. Would you be able to achieve the same goal and be okay with it if instead of saying, hey, let's go to 35% and take that extra 2% to the county, if we just left it at 33% and said 31% to the state and 2% to the county, you wind up, in theory, with the same amount of money, the state would wind up with a very smaller amount of, of, of money of the, the billions of dollars we collect through gaming it, it looks like it would be you know maybe a million something like that absolutely that'd be great that's that's a great compromise and a great solution we okay. would love that okay uh, thank you thank you any further questions okay thank you seeing none thank you very much Appreciate that concludes it. the testimony of house bill 1184 delegate howard house bill 1185 If I bring up my Good afternoon, Madam Vice Chair, Madam Chair, colleagues, Delegate Howard, for uh, very pleased to bring House Bill 1185 before the Ways and Means Committee. Uh, this bill alters the existing one time income tax credit for long term care premiums. Under the bill, the credit may be claimed only with the respect to policies after December 31st, 2023. Essentially, what it is is there's a one-time $500 uh, tax credit for the purchase of long-term long care. We'd like to see that uh, become an annual. Uh, and if you look in 
in the bill on the analysis on page two. It gives you a little bit of a side-by-side -side on that, outlays uh, some of the time frame on that also. So we would drop it down to 250 a year for uh, 2023, 2024, no, I'm sorry, 2024 and 2025, and then it would step up, step back up to 500, and I believe 2026, um, you know, when I put this bill in before, uh, it came to my attention that as Maryland population grows, it's also growing older. Uh, in the Economic Matters Committee, uh, former colleague of ours, Bill Frick, did a lot of work in expanding access to 401ks and things like that for what we would call the silver tsunami. Right now, under the U.S. Census data, the predictors are, and, and I even have a, an article here from the, the Baltimore Sun, the predictors are by 2030, there will be approximately 7 million, Maryland, uh, 7 million Marylanders, and about 30% of them will be over 65. And the fact of the matter is, is that we do not have the facilities to take care of these folks as this, you know, as this uh, gray tsunami kind of comes about. What I'm trying to do is get ahead of this and um, keep, quite frankly, the people, uh, older people in the homes and the communities that they built I think that's the best place for them to age, is to age in place. And, um, you know, I'll just uh, quote is a 2005 article in the Baltimore Sun entitled Maryland 2030, More Crowded, Population Older. It states the U.S. Census projections show the numbers of Marylanders 65 and older is expected to double by 2030 to about 1.2 million Marylanders, which is one of every five residents. Um, the uh, Anabon Busu, the chief executive officer of the Sage Policy Group, an economic policy consul consulting firm in Baltimore, predicted that as the ranks of older residents grow, the demand for human services, health care, transportation, uh, uh, transportation oriented to the elderly is going to grow by leaps and bounds, putting pressure on government to provide them. This bill is an attempt to get ahead of that, try to incentivize the purchase of this very, very uh, important uh, health care premium, and I ask for a favorable um, vote on the bill. Madam Chair, uh, committee members, my name is Paul Schwartz, representing the National Active and Tired Federal Employees. A couple of weeks ago, you may remember, I testified before this committee in support of Vaughn Stewart's bill, HB 160, which was designed to address an, in, an inequity for a specific group of taxpayers, those who purchased long-term care insurance in, 20, in 2005 or prior. This bill, HB 1185, is designed to address the economic impact on Maryland's budget of the high cost of Medicaid and nursing homes. As I previously mentioned, Medicaid accounts for more than a quarter of Maryland's budget. Nursing homes account for a major portion of Medicaid. Anything that this committee can do to help keep Marylanders in their homes longer by delaying the need to enter nursing homes will have a positive impact on the Maryland budget. HB 1185 does that by providing a phased-in annual tax incentive to encourage the purchase of long-term care insurance at an early age when it is most affordable and, most importantly, enable purchasers to keep their insurance when they reach the point that they will need it. Figures from the Federal Department of Health and Human Services show that over one half of all persons 65 years old and older will need substantial amounts of long-term care at some point in their lives, and about 15% of these seniors will need five or more years of long-term care. The costs of long-term care are high, ranging from around $50,000 a year for home health aides to well over $100,000 for nursing home care. Only 17% of baby boomers have planned for long-term care needs. Only 10% of adults over the age of 65 own long-term care insurance. I ask this committee to not leave seniors behind. I hope that's a catchy phrase. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions? I have a quick question. Um, Delegate Howard, how did you, I think it's an interesting bill, I also am interested in Delegate Vaughn Stewart's bill, mm -hmm. and I know that you deal with the same issue but approach it differently. How did you come up with your date of when to start? Um, I think you said December 
Yeah, so I think it's December 31st. So how did you pick that date? That was in bill drafting. Okay. And, that's, and, that, and Madam Chair, if I could, just for a brief second, look, mm -hmm. we all want to, we all want to find a solution here. And I understand uh, the loss, the, the lower projected revenues, and I've read the fiscal note moving forward. Um, you know, as far as return on investment is concerned and, in, and incentivizing this category of folks uh, to purchase this long-term health care insurance, I would absolutely love to work with a subcommittee um, because, you know, maybe it's 250, 250, 250 moving forward um, instead, but anything more than just the one time. Thank you. Any qu other questions? Uh, unless it's continued over a period of time, and it's not lost just in the first year, it's not going to encourage people to purchase it or, more importantly, to keep it when they need it later on in life. That's okay. why it has to be over, a, you know, each year, annual, not just one time. Okay. Thank you very much. That concludes the testimony on House Bill 1185. Thank, Thank you, you. Collins. Oh, on that bill? I'm sorry. Oh, yes, you did. I'm, I apologize. House Bill 1185, Brett Linginger. Thank you. I apologize. No problem. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Brett Linginger here today on uh, House Bill 1185, testifying in full support on behalf of uh, NAFA Maryland, uh, National Association of Insurance and Financial Advisors. I think everything was uh, summed up very well. We testified in support of uh, Delegate Stewart's bill for all the same reasons. So. Uh, me too. Thank you. Any questions? Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. And now that really concludes the testimony on House Bill 1185. Calling Delegate Barnes, House Bill 1102. Madam Chair, Madam Vice Chair, Ways and Means Committee. For the record, I am Darrell Barnes. I am here to present House Bill 1102 and ask for a favorable vote. The bill that is before you I think is unique and an opportunity to start something new here in the state of Maryland. The bill before you is a game of chance. This bill could be a scratch off. This bill will help our local gas stations and other merchants. This bill would amend the state government articles by authorizing the award of a prize in a state lottery game to be based on the outcomes of, of a sports event in which the prize award based upon chance rather than skill. This would allow the Merlin Lottery to offer a lottery game ticketed based upon the outcome of sporting events, engaging some additional lottery players who would like sports but not the actual sports betting. This would be a traditional lottery game sold in person at lottery retailers where sports wagering licenses cannot offer bets. Let me be clear. This game would not be sports wagering or parlay betting. Sports wagering is a game of skill whereas this would be a game of chance in which players would not be able to select teams or et cetera, as they do in sports wagering or parlay card betting. This game completely takes the skill component out of the process while at the same time allows the player to be a part of the sports betting event. 
my panel will be able to speak more in depth on what we're trying to do here with this game. I think this is a unique opportunity here in the state of Maryland. I think this is something that we all should be excited about as we continue to move forward. And Madam Chair, I would like my panel to be able to speak. Here we go. For the record, John Martin, Director, Maryland Lottery and Gaming. Um, thank you, Delegate Barnes. I uh, appreciate the, uh, the introduction there. Um, as the delegate uh, identified, this is an opportunity to engage 4,400 lottery retailers who currently have no uh, outcome in the sports wagering marketplace. This gives them a chance to participate in the grander sports um, entertainment aspect. It gives, more importantly, significant numbers of their players an opportunity to also participate in sports by playing a game of chance and gives them the chance to uh, uh, participate at a very nominal rate. It is not a competitive product to anything offered in the casino or sports wagering franchise. It is totally separate. Quite frankly, I think the traditional sports wagering player won't even give this game a second look. It just does not appeal to their buying behaviors. So we hope that this is something that, uh, with your support and, and uh, approval, we can implement uh, in the not too distant future. Hi, I'm Sean Ford with the Maryland Lottery and Gaming Control Agency. <clears throat> Excuse me, you have our letter of information, um, and I think uh, Delegate Barnes and our agency director, John Martin, did a good job of summing up the issue, so I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Good afternoon, James Butler, Maryland Lottery and Gaming Assistant Deputy Director. Again, what Director Martin spoke of, this is a purely lottery game. It is not sports wagering. It is not parlay betting. This is just an opportunity for us to launch a game dealing based on the outcomes of a sporting event. So with that, I'll entertain any questions. Delegate Ebersol. Okay. Sorry that I was out, so if this has been addressed, um, I'm, I'll back off. But I was waiting on you. But. Well, thank you. I, the, the chair's moving through the bills pretty quickly today, so she caught me a little off guard. Well done. Um, so two questions, if I may. One is, did we address this, that uh, will the players be allowed to choose which teams or who they're parlaying? Because it um, feels more like a game of skill in that case. If you're randomly throwing them up there, we might be able to hold that it's a game of chance. Um, so, And I don't believe I see in the bill that it distinguishes that. Yes, that's a very good question, Delegate Ebersole. And so one thing that we would like to do, uh, speaking with Delegate Barnes about it, is to strike one line in the bill that I think would address that. On uh, line four, page two, uh, we'd like to strike, uh, strike uh, made by the player or. So the language should read now that it's based purely on random generated. So you can take out the player's ability to yes. choose which teams. Will you let them choose, I want to parlay five teams or what sport? I mean, what's your vision for it? It's not in the bill, but I'm curious what your vision is for it. The vision is, depending on where we are in the sports calendar, let's say the baseball season, a player walks into a lottery retailer and asks for a sports or a, a baseball ticket, and 10 games for that evening's activities would be presented, uh, the Red Sox versus the White Sox, right. the Yankees versus the Dodgers. So a 10-game parlay. Or yes. you might choose, but you might choose five if you felt like it was a good well, night for them. Well, they play all 10 games, right. and it's random in that the, the, uh, the, the winner of the game is selected by the computer. So it's a quick pick. Right. But then they watch the games. That evening, they find out they have six of 10 winners. And then that's where the prize structure, six of 10, maybe they break even, seven of 10, eight, nine, right. 10 of 10. So my, my question was more to, will the, would, would 10 be your, like, would you, you would preempt, you have to pick 10 teams. You can't say, I only want to parlay three tonight as a player. You're more, you would, it would be more driven by you. Actually, you don't pick games. anything. The, 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 the computer generates, these are the 10 games tonight. No, but 10 is, um, what I'm asking about is, are you thinking it would definitely be 10? Yes. Okay, thank you. And the other thing, I'm looking at the fiscal note, and I'm just wondering, because it says, if instituted a state lottery game of nature described by this bill, is not anticipated to significantly increase overall lottery sales in the state, Further excluding such wagering from the definition of sports wagering, it's not anticipated to alter sports wagering revenues. It sounds like this would change nothing according to, you know, do you want to dispute this, this evaluation by the fiscal note writer? Because otherwise it sounds like, wow, we're going to do something, but it's not going to do anything. Quite, quite frankly, Delegate, again, we, we see very little crossover between the traditional sports wagering player and, and the, the person who would be interested in this game. There's very little commonality there. 
But you'd expect to get to increase lottery intake by offering another game. Oh, it definitely will increase uh, the lottery yeah. side. It should have no effect at all on sports wagering. Thank you. Delegate, Thank you, Madam Chair. Delegate Patterson, then Delegate Buckle. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Delegate Barnes, for bringing this bill to our attention. I have a question um, as it relates to the SWAT in, in terms of our, our licenses. Are you still meeting and, and our licenses still being uh, awarded regarding sports betting? Yes. So the SWARC, uh, this is a Sports Wagering Application Review Commission, is still meeting. We are still um, evaluating some of the applicants. They have to be first vetted by the Maryland Lottery and Gaming and determine that they are qualified to move forward to SWARC mm -hmm. for their review and consideration of a mobile or a retail sports book. Okay. The other part I have, I'll, I will be... Um, <coughs> concern about <clears throat> because I represent a district where we have a small casino and we've only had its existence for a few years. Why is this necessary at this time and is there, is there going to be um, competition or fallout as a result of passage of what you're proposing? Wait, wait, let, let me before uh, the director speaks. This has nothing to do with uh, uh, the traditional sports wagering of a sports book or uh, a physical location. This is something totally different. So those that have concerns about that, this bill does not compete with sports betting or competes with uh, you going into the casino to place a bet. Mm -hmm. This has nothing to do with that. So let me just finish. So in your area where you have uh, the riverboat, they should not fear this bill at all because it has nothing to do uh, with impeding on what they're doing uh, from a sports betting standpoint. Uh, as you know, you and I, along with uh, Delegate Eversol, we were intricately involved in ensuring uh, that sports betting passed. We were intricately involved in ensuring that minorities had an opportunity to participate in sports betting. So when this is, is presented, I just want to be clear, and I think I said it early on uh, in my remarks, uh, that this would not defer or get in the way of any of those entities that are, are there. As uh, Mr. Butler's already stated, uh, there are applicants that are applying for licenses. This has nothing to do with stopping someone for getting a license in sports betting. This is just another tool in which the Lottery Commission could have as another offering when they offer all the other things that they offer from scratch off games and other things. This is just something that we're presenting uh, that's brand new that could be here in the state of Maryland. I appreciate that, but the question was, <clears throat> why is it necessary at this time? I, I think there are two constituencies that are served by this. Uh, first is again, the, le the retailer community, 4,400 retailer partners, many of them small businesses, first generation immigrants who are working day in and day out to, to provide additional income and revenue for their business and for their families. Mm -hmm. This gives them an opportunity that they've shut out of the current sports wagering platforms. Uh, this gives them a chance to participate in a broader sports product for their clientele. And many of their clientele are intimidated by going into a casino. They don't understand all the nuances of sports wagering. Right. This is a very simple quick pick game that allows them, if they're a sports fan, if they're a baseball fan, football, basketball, mm -hmm. to participate at that level and get some uh, um, ancillary benefit of being part of a larger picture. Okay, right, and, and Delegate Patterson, if I may, the only reason why we're here is the sports wagering law, the definition is so broad that it could encompass a lottery product. But for that language, we wouldn't be here. The lottery has the inherent authority to do any type of lottery type game that it wants to. Again, that's the only reason why we're here is to clarify that lottery products that are offered by the agency are not sports wagering. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Delegate Buckle. Thank you, Madam Chair. So I had the same question to Mr. Butler that uh, Delegate Patterson asked. I just happened to ask it while uh, Comptroller Learman was still testifying. That's exactly what I asked about the process of the SWARC and where we stood because it doesn't seem like we have a 
a very robust uh, uptake, so to speak, of those Class B brick and mortar licenses that we all anticipated a couple of years ago. There would be, you know, widespread uh, um, uh, penetration throughout different counties, different communities of the state of having that. It doesn't seem to have happened yet. But I, I guess the two questions that I have. Are there any other states that do this, that offer a lottery product that allows you to go in and say, hey, uh, I want to bet NFL football this Sunday, you give me 10 games randomly generated, and then I go home at night and watch the games? The only state I'm aware of that does that is the state of Delaware, but that is a classic parlay right. game of skill process. I'm not aware of any other lottery in the country that does a game of chance, which would give us a great opportunity to kind of set the expectations. So, so I have found, uh, much to my chagrin, that in fact sports gambling is quite a game of skill, and I'm not that skillful at it, apparently, but uh, it, it definitely is, is different. So that, I guess, is, is kind of, to be fair, I think I'm hearing kind of two different things. So my friend Delegate Barnes is saying this doesn't have anything to do with sports gaming. No one who wants to do sports gaming will play this. But Mr. Martin just said that this will enable people who are interested in sports gaming or sports in general, but are perhaps intimidated or don't feel they have a, a, a bevy of knowledge to walk into a casino and understand the intricacies of, you know, are you taking someone minus 110 versus plus 290? What does that mean? They can just come in to their local lottery retailer and say, hey, uh, I want some action tonight because I like the action. So I got five bucks, give me the action on 10 games, and I'll sit at home and watch the games. That seems to me like it is kind of sports gaming, uh, even because that's what they're there for. They're there to watch the results of the games, not just simply to say, hey, there's a randomly generated number or, or you know, other things that you do. Do you think there's any dichotomy between that? I think you'll get a small percentage of people that will experiment with both, but I think Clearly, they are complementary. I think there's a place for both in the marketplace. Okay. And then my final question, I guess, is, and I should know this better, I know that to place a sports wager in Maryland at a brick and mortar or online, they're supposed to have, uh, you know, online security. You have to be 21 years old or over. How old do you have to be to walk into a lottery retail or gas station, whatever, and buy a lottery ticket? 18 years old. So then 18-year-olds, presumably even people that still be in high school, I think I was perhaps still in high school when I was 18 for a short period of time, you could go in. Yeah, I, wasn't, I wasn't 19. I was not 19. I, I did not fail any years. Thank you, Delegate Eversol. But could those individuals, then you could be 18, you could be in high school, you could go in and buy this sports gaming, let's not call it a sports gaming product. That's not what you want to call it. But this sports-oriented lottery ticket. Just as they could buy a pick ticket, a Powerball ticket, any other controlled age-controlled lottery product. Okay, thank you. Any further questions? Okay, seeing none, thank you very much. That concludes the testimony on House Bill 1102, Delegate Barnes, House Bill 1074. And there is a Carol McDermott and Ryan Killa, and there is one person virtually. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, for the record, I'm Delegate Darrell Barnes. And I really want everyone to pay attention to this particular bill. All right. I'm because I think this bill will so, resonate okay, so then with then. everyone in the room. This bill will allow an individual or business entity to claim a credit against the state income tax for the first $500 of a purchase of an automated external defibrillator, affectionately known as AED, purchased for the use of, uh, at a restaurant located in the state with an annual gross income of at least $400,000 to a certain limitations. To my right is the reason why we are here. This testimony of this young lady to my right will speak to the fact that she saw the untimely death of her husband by a cardiac arrest. And I really want to put that in perspective as to 
the things that we do as legislature, as legislators. The cardiac arrest remains a public health crisis according to the reports of the American Health Association. In one year, one year, there were 436,000 Americans that died from a cardiac arrest. Approximately 350,000 cardiac arrests occurred outside of a hospital each year. Her husband, Joe, could have been alive only if there was a AED at the hospital, I mean at the restaurant in which he died in. When he had his cardiac arrest, it took t over 10 minutes for the ambulance to get there. But if this machine was at the restaurant, his life could have been saved. So I just put in perspective of the work that we do here in Annapolis and the impact that it has and the lives that we can help. And in sometimes, and in this case, the lives that we could have saved. And sometimes I know it's hard and I know sometimes we look at money, but in this case, I want you to look at people. Because at some point, you all may experience or have experienced a loved one, a family member, a friend, a colleague that may also go through the same thing as this young lady did by someone in your family having a cardiac arrest. And I dare do I say that you will want someone to attend to them quickly, swiftly, and right now we have an opportunity to do that in the restaurants that we go in. And on that note, I would ask for a favorable vote on House Bill 1074. Thank you. Thank you, Delegate Barnes. Madam Chair, Madam Vice Chair, members of the committee, Joe Shea, my dear heart husband, was a joyful man who's not ready for his life to end. He was a public school teacher for over 33 years. He was a Reiki master who helped Congressman Jamie Raskin through the first fight for his life. He rode motorcycles with Senator Astell. He was a student pilot. He taught Hapkido, competitive shooting, and scuba diving. He was an officiant who united many couples in marriage, including our two daughters. He was a lot of fun a loving, honorable, courageous, good man. He was a victim of sudden cardiac arrest. There was not an AED available in the restaurant. He did not survive. DeMar Hamlin is a joyful young man, a talented athlete who gives generously to his community, a good man. He was a victim of sudden cardiac arrest. There was an AED available. He did survive. About 1,000 people a day die from sudden cardiac arrest out of hospital more than outnumber deaths from cancers, house fires, assault with firearms, traffic accidents, diabetes, suicides combined. Cedar sinai Heart Institute states, <clears throat> compared to Caucasian, African Americans face twice the rate of cardiac arrest and are an average of six years younger. The Maryland Restaurant Association website says <clears throat> the restaurant industry is the most diverse in the country. The patrons that support the Maryland restaurants are a beautifully diverse population who spent over $15 billion in restaurants in 2021. According to MIMS, the cost of AEDs go from $700 to $1,700. The cost to individuals, families, and the state from someone who can, <clears throat> who can be hospitalized for weeks, even months, because they did not receive a timely shock is exponentially more. There is no mandate, but please, incentivize Maryland restaurant owners to have an AED available so people like my Joe can survive. It's a very small price to pay to protect the owners, the employees, and the patrons who keep the restaurants open. From my heart, thank you. I also want to mention that there is an AED at, in each building here on campus at the security entrance. The State House has one on every floor. Thank you.
Hi, my name is Ryan Kilo. I am a paramedic and an emergency department uh, nurse, uh, and also, I guess, I consider an expert in AEDs. Uh, I uh, knew Carol's husband, know her well, and she asked me to come today to give you all a quick demonstration of just how simple these are to use, just to put the ask for AEDs and what you would be approving uh, for a tax credit in perspective of what they do. Um, so as I said, while I get this ready, this happens to 1,000 people a day. Uh, less than 5% of them survive because waiting for EMS is too long. The average EMS response time in this country is 10 to 12 minutes, and for every minute that passes, before you get shocked by an AED, your chances of surviving decrease by 10% per minute. So at earliest 10 minutes, you have a very little chance of surviving, even though we have the best EMS system in the country um, and best training, but time just isn't on our side when it comes to this. So these things are so simple to use. You open them up. It does not require training. You turn the machine on. It talks to you, shows you pictures. Unit okay. Carol's going to be my, my model demonstration here. You would simply take the upper layers of clothes off of the victim, put these pads on. I'm not going to make Carol strip down here in front of everybody today. But you put the pads on the victim. Pads the machine the will know the pads are attached. Analyzes. It's showing you what not to do. The words are here, and it's audible. Touch. Easier than an iPhone. Analyzes. Shock advice. Analyzes the heart rhythm. Touch. Determines if the person Touch. needs to be shocked or not. Can't hurt anybody with it. Once this determined person needs to be shocked, you push the button, it Shock shocks delivered. you. Start CPR. It tells you to start CPR in two minutes. It is going to come back um, and reanalyze the rhythm of shock again if necessary. This is the same thing that happens in the shows you watch on TV where they're shocking the person. This is the same thing that happens in the ER and the back of an ambulance, except this is for public access, very simple to use, very inexpensive, and it's the only way we're going to improve uh, the chance of survival in sudden cardiac arrest. Thank you. I think there is one person signed up virtually. Sammy Zakaria. Hi there, Sammy Zakaria. Zakaria. We can hear you. We can't see your face. Okay. Now I'm allowed to start my video. There you Hi, go. everybody. Hi. <laughs> uh, thank you for the opportunity and inviting me to testify in support of um, House Bill this house bill. Uh, my name is Sammy Zachary. I'm the director of the cardiac intensive care unit at the Johns Hopkins Bayview Medical Center. I'm actually working right here right now. <laughs> um, so that's why I couldn't be there in person. And I also serve as the governor elect of the Maryland chapter of the American College of Cardiology. And so that, that represents over 1000 cardiologists and cardiovascular professionals in the state of Maryland. Between my personal experiences and the experiences of my members, we've seen far too many patients who had a sudden cardiac arrest. Actually, right now, I, I'm, I have um, uh, 12 patients in the cardiac ICU. Five of them have needed defibrillation, and actually one of them needed seven shocks. So it's a pretty common problem, and it's something that, that, that we're very familiar with. In the best of circumstances, the average patient who does not get prompt defibrillation remains in ICU for one to two weeks and needs rehabilitation facilities for many weeks afterwards. And, and really, in, in the worst of circumstances, death occurs. But the majority are in between. They have irreversible brain injury. They linger in the hospital system for weeks and life need lifelong rehab care. This is clearly financially devastating for our healthcare system since each ICU day is three to $4,000 per day and lifelong rehab is in the hundreds of thousands of the, uh, per year. More importantly, this is devastating for the patient. It's devastating for their families who now um, lost a family member uh, and who's now in hospitalization the whole time. It's clearly emotionally damaging for families as Carol mentioned earlier. In contrast, if a patient in sudden cardiac death a cardiac arrest gets prompt defibrillation with a defibrillator. If it's available in the restaurant uh, or other facilities, they're much more likely to live and much more to live with a great quality of life. I've had patients leave the hospital after only two to three days of hospitalization and they go back to their families and they go back to work within weeks. They become full participants in, in Maryland uh, life and then at work. It's a miracle and uh, this financially a tax credit is a big uh, benefit uh, and we're happy to support it from uh, the Maryland uh, ACC chapter. Thank you so much. Thank you. Committee, are there any questions? Delegate Buckle. 
Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. This is a, a, a great bill. Um, in 2006, well before I came here, 2005, I represented the family of a young girl named Kelly Sines. She was 16 years old. I knew the story. She, was, she died at Bell High School in Frostburg, Maryland, because she had a sudden cardiac arrhythmia event. And like what happened to your husband, uh, about 12 minutes went by before they could get all of the necessary services there. And she died. The school didn't have an AED. You mentioned that AEDs are now ubiquitous. Uh, this legislature passed a law, I believe in 2006, before I came here, as a result of Kelly's case and a few other incidences of students that died of these sudden cardiac events in schools. I think this is, uh, I've, I've litigated thousands of cases. I've tried dozens of jury trials. I'll, I'll never forget. I'll never forget her father talking about the things that he would lose, walking her down the aisle, seeing her graduate from college, uh, because something that could have been there wasn't there. And so I really hope, you know, you've got a great bill sponsor and advocate. He happens to be the chair of the, of the subcommittee. And I really hope uh, that we can do this. And I guess the only question that I had for my friend, Delegate Barnes, is the, the bill is, is limited by its nature to providing the tax credit for restaurants that want to have that. Is there a particular connection where you think that that's the main place maybe we should go now? We have mandated them in a lot of other places. We don't mandate them in private places. Usually providing that tax credit helps these folks to defray the costs. Um, do you think it's even something that could be expanded or maybe restaurants is just the best place to start with right now? You know, as this was presented, I, I think restaurants are the, the starting point. Um, especially when you, we understand the nature of, of fiscal notes and, and what that looks like and how that kind of deters our thinking process sometimes. But I believe that if we start here, this is a great starting point. Uh, I think this is needed everywhere. Uh, she just gave the example of an NFL player. Obviously, yeah. they had the AEDs at the field. But just think about uh, what goes on in, in sports teams around the, the country. And how many kids play sports every single day uh, youth sports that do not have an AED at the, at the field or the basketball court or the tennis court or whatever it is that this is needed. You know, so listen, at, at the end of the day, it is the will of the committee, but I think that we have to start somewhere. And, and in my opinion, uh, the restaurants in honor of this courageous woman and her husband, I think we start there. Thank you, my friend. Thank you very much for the bill. And thank you for your testimony today. I really know how difficult it is. And it's wonderful that you're turning a tragedy into something that can potentially be positive for other people. I appreciate that. Thank you. Delegate Hartman. Thank you, Madam Chair. My questions um, are, are similar to Delegate Buckles, and I, I do believe it's a great bill. So my thought was, why just restaurants? Um, and, and that was alluded to there. But if you are going to look at restaurants, why the um, $400,000 uh, earmark as far as level of business? I'm not familiar with restaurants. So, um, you know, if you're in a carryout or something, um, right. is that a $400,000 business? What, what does that $400,000 restaurant look like? Uh, I, I think it initially matched up with the minimum wage. That, that's where the number originally came from. But I'm all for them being everywhere. And when you think about why restaurants, so in 2021, which was just still the end of the pandemic, and you know a lot of people were still staying at home, Maryland's, Marylanders still spent $15 billion in restaurants. So there are a lot of people going in and out of restaurants. They're open, a lot are open 24 hours, you know, seven days, you know, they're open seven days a week. So there are a lot of people, Marylanders, who are in their restaurants, and that's what we're trying to the target. Um, target. Do you know if there's sales tax on these since it's medical equipment or? Yeah, there are sales tax, I believe, uh, on here. But, uh, you know, I think with the, the tax credit, it kind of helps offset what that, that cost is and absorb some of that tax uh, to make it more affordable for those restaurants to be able to purchase. No, I agree. And with the sale, if there is sales tax on it, then the state's realizing revenue there that may not be. Um, reflected in the fiscal notes. So, yes. thank you. Thank you, Delegate Wu. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Carol, for testifying, and thank Jie for showing the AED. I worked at FDA more than 10 years ago, actually testing AEDs, and so it's, it's wonderful to see that again. So, I, Delegate Barnes, thank you very much for bringing this great bill. I want to expand it in a different direction. So, beyond the AEDs, there are other devices, maybe life uh, saving, for example, IP pen, right? So, I'm wondering, have you think about some other um, devices including in similar tax credits? Yeah, so over the years in this committee, we have provided tax credits and, and things for other devices that, that help save lives and students with asthma and, mm -hmm. and other uh, things. You know, but I, I listen, I, I don't want to lose focus. Mm -hmm. uh, for me, uh, this is the bill of the day uh, that I think if we can uh, wrap our arms around what we're trying to get accomplished, I think there's always opportunities year after year after year uh, to make adjustments to help other initiatives and programs. Thank you. Delegate Feldmar. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Delegate, for bringing this bill, and, and thank you for sharing your story with us um, and for your advocacy on this issue. Um, I, I, my question is for anyone who feels they can, can speak to it. It, it seems to me the, the fiscal note, you know, is a sort of indeterminate amount of impact on, on revenue. And even though it's difficult to quantify, it, it seems to me, though, that that would be offset, at least to some extent, in terms of the, the economic impact of of early intervention, right? And, and getting that shock delivered as soon as possible has to have exponential impact in terms of cost of care, the intensity of care that's going to be needed, the length of recovery and rehabilitation, and how soon someone can return to the workforce. You know, I mean, I, I don't expect you to have a specific number, but can, can someone sort of speak to that side of it? Yes, ma'am, I can, I can speak some of that. That's, a, that's an excellent question, because when you think about a 500-hour tax credit, you want to see the other side of that, right? So um, as, as Dr. Sammy pointed out there, he's working in the ICU with these patients that come in. Patients that get shocked quickly, like DeMar Hamlin did, how long did he spend in the hospital? I think it was five days or so. If you get a shock late, you're going to have much more damage, lifelong damage. It's going to require much more hospitalization long term. So from a state point of view, you know, the state's responsible for Medicaid, right? So you take me, I'm on Medicaid, I get shocked in 10 minutes, I get a heartbeat back, I spend three weeks in the ICU, that's the average of three to $5,000 per day. So if Medicaid's paying for that, you're talking about, thou and then, you know, rehab and long term. So you can be speaking of, like you heard the testimony before, long term care, $100,000, $200,000 a year versus $500 tax credit. So average day for somebody who gets defibrillated quickly and resuscitated, maybe fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 at best. Um, someone who gets shocked late or not at all is probably thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars 50000 Any further questions? Okay, seeing none, thank you. That concludes the testimony on House Bill 1074. Thank you. Calling House Bill 1106, Delegate Austin. <laughs> Good afternoon, Madam Chair, Madam Vice Chair, and members of the Ways and Means Committee. It's a privilege to be here today to present to you House Bill 1106. This bill is innovative, and I am very excited about the potential for what it can do for our state. In fact, there's not another state in the country that's offering such opportunities to its residents. Currently, um, student loan debt is, has skyrocketed. We've all seen the news stories. It's well over a trillion dollars and pushing two trillion. It is um, second only to mortgages in terms of debt that we carry as consumers in the U.S. What this bill will do is it will allow more people to contribute to 529 plans. Now, 
our state has some current issues that are being worked on with our 529 plan, but this is for the investment portion of the plan, not the prepaid portion. So I just want to be very clear with that. Um, second, in reading through the bill, I know that we are going to have some changes to the 529 board. So once we'll make an amendment to conform this so that it, um, so that the requirements are not on the board, but on the actual treasurer. That being said, um, what this bill seeks to do is to create an opportunity where 529s will be treated similar to 401k plans. So that persons, whether it's the employer who employs someone um, or a daycare, they can provide contributions to a student's 529 plan so that we're all contributing almost like a village to um, care for and provide financial support for our students. This will, over the long term, decrease the amount of money that the state would have to pay to children who are low to moderate income because they would potentially have resources in their 529 plans. So the first thing that the bill does is allow employers and businesses to contribute. The second thing is it increases the amount that can be contributed um, up to $16,000 over a 10-year period. The bill also establishes a maximum contribution to the plan of $750,000. We're currently at about $500,000. And with the rising cost of tuition, we don't know what tuition is going to cost in the future. So this protects us so that as tuition rises, our state um, residents can con continue to contribute more money to their children's plans. Um, the bill will also require the state to set up plans for wards of the state. So these are people that are in foster care or maybe in um, that have been adjudicated delinquent. We want to make sure that they have an opportunity to attend college as well. So it requires a minimal contribution of only $500 annually that the state would set up for a 529 plan for those children that are considered wards of the state. Um, the funds would continue to accrue interest while the child is a minor. Once the child reaches age, they could access those funds. If, however, by the age 26, they haven't used the funds, those monies would revert back to the general fund. Um, so in conclusion, I think we all agree that higher education is an important thing. We all agree that the cost has been skyrocketing and our state has definitely done its part to keep costs low. But even with that, we can't control what may happen in the future. So we want to make sure that we're looking at ways that we can have more money go into this plan. Due, some, due to some technical difficulties, um, the person who introduced this idea to me wasn't able to get his testimony submitted. But I do want to tell you um, just a little bit briefly about him and why this has become so important. Um, you all have probably heard of philanthropist Robert Smith that paid for the Morehouse students' college tuition payoff. Um, the person that he hired to administer the program was his college roommate, Mr. Keith Schultz. He now runs a program where they are attempting to eradicate student debt, and he brought this idea to me. Um, the state of Virginia is looking at legislation like this as well as Washington State. So it would be amazing for Maryland to lead the way in this effort. Um, Mr. Schultz is very dedicated to making sure that students' um, debt is eliminated along with Mr. Smith, and that's where the idea for this bill comes from. I wish it could, I could say it was my brilliant work, but it is not. But I did want to present that to the committee. So thank you. I'm honored to have the support of Catholic Charities um, in this bill, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Are there any questions for Delegate Alston? Okay, seeing none, and if he wants to submit his testimony, he can. It would just be submitted late. That's fine. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. And that concludes the testimony on House Bill 1106. Delegate Vogel, House Bill 1064. And you have with you Cameron Kilberg, Ashley Bagwell, and Kevin Canale. Madam Chair, Madam Vice Chair, members of the House Ways and Means Committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify before this committee in support of HB 1064. 
HB 1064 applies the sales and use tax to a sale or use of, a certain, of certain home amenity rentals and authorizes counties or municipalities to impose similar taxes. The legislature has previously instituted taxing structures for short-term rentals like Airbnb. Uh, short-term rentals are subject to both the sales tax and the local lodging transient tax. House Bill 1064 replicates this model to tax other home amenities that are currently being rented through home amenity rental platforms. Swimming pools are an example of this, as you will hear from my panel. Uh, we are seeing significant advancements in the home sharing economy, and we need to ensure that our tax policies keep pace with the accelerating innovation while ensuring consistent and fair tax structures and regulations. Thank you for your time, and I request a favorable report. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, Madam Vice Chair, and members of the committee. I'm Ashley Bagwell, here this afternoon on behalf of Swimply in support of House Bill 1064. Thank you to Delegate Vogel for introducing the bill and for the excellent explanation. Here with me this afternoon is Cameron Kilberg with Swimply, and before I turn it over to her, I just wanted to provide some context for the committee for this bill. For the last year, we've been working with Montgomery County to regulate home amenity rentals. And earlier this year, at the end of January, Council Member Will Jawando introduced legislation and a corresponding zoning text amendment to do that, using as the base for the regulatory structure what's already in place for short-term rentals. Of course, the taxing part of that full regulatory structure, though, is something that the county can't do themselves. Uh, they need y'all and the rest of the General Assembly to handle that, and so that's why we're here um, today with Delegate Vogel on House Bill 1064. Again, this bill from a taxing stru structure simply copies what's already in place for short-term rentals. I do wanna uh, to point out one thing. Um, it, it applies the sales tax as well as, as De Delegate Vogel said, the, the transient and lodging tax at the local level. What we did do is half the rate of the local taxing amount, the idea being that someone who is renting a home amenity rental, and you'll, you'll hear more about this um, from Ms. Kilberg, but you're renting for two to three hours, whereas with a short-term rental, you're renting for uh, one day or more. And so we tried to make that um, proportional relative to the amount of uh, time that you're renting. Um, something. So with that, Madam Chair, uh, I will turn it over to Ms. Kilberg. I would urge a favorable vote, and I'm happy to help answer any questions. Thank you, um, Madam Chair, Vice Chair, and committee members. On behalf of Swimply, I'm here today in strong support of HB 1064, which adds home amenity rentals to the sales and use tax and authorizes a county or municipality to impose a home amenity rental tax. Swimply is a home amenity rental platform which allows homeowners to share underutilized portions of their home with their neighbors by the hour. While Swimply has started with the sharing of pools, we are moving towards a platform where all underutilized spaces, which are not sleeping quarters, can be shared, be it your yard for a dog to run or sharing your garage for someone to work on their car. We are an extension of the home sharing economy. The home sharing economy has been growing and evolving since 2008 with the founding of Airbnb. And with it, state and local regulations and taxes must also continue to keep pace. Home amenity rentals do not currently meet any state or local definition for tax purposes. While they are part of the home share economy, they lack lodging, which makes the transient occupancy or the hotel tax inapplicable. Thus, today, any local jurisdiction which wants to regulate and therefore tax home amenity rentals much as they do short-term rentals may not apply such a tax. This bill would change that and put home amenity rentals on the same regulatory ground as short-term rentals. As Ashley pointed out, this bill makes no policy changes. Uh, the sales tax portion of the code simply adds a definition of a home amenity rental, includes this new product alongside short-term rentals, while the local authorization simply mirrors the state's hotel rental tax. The only alteration, as Ashley again pointed out, is the reduction in the rates, which have been halved, in order to make the hourly rentals on par with the overnight rentals, which by default grants you 20 plus hours for the product while you pay by the hour for home amenity rentals. With this, I respectfully ask for your support of HB 1064. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. 
Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Kevin Canella here on behalf of the Maryland Association of Counties in support of the bill with an amendment. First of all, I certainly appreciate this bill, including local governments, as uh, being able to implement these taxes at the local level. We've had a lot of challenges over the years with Airbnb and other short-term rental platforms trying to get the same authority. What we'd ask for here is that these, uh, the state is treating these now uniformly across the board. We'd ask that the full freight uh, for local hotel taxes, hotel taxes be applied to these rentals as well. Um, in the bill, it's up to 15 hours. I mean, it's almost a day. Certainly understand why um, they have the rate, but we feel like this should be treated uniformly with short-term rentals, and if we're gonna do that, we'd appreciate the ability to apply the full local hotel tax rate to these transactions. So again, support the bill. I really appreciate being included. Just with that amendment, we'd ask that we make this completely uniform across the board, and we'd ask for that authority as well. Okay, committee, are there any questions? Okay, seeing no questions, thank you. And that concludes the testimony on House Bill 1064. Delegate Vogel, House Bill 1181. And you have Raymond Wang, Matthew Boley, Boley Natasha Mayhew, and Ed Noonan. Thank you, Madam Chair, Madam Vice Chair, members of the House Ways and Means Committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify in support of HB 1181. HB 1181 provides credit against the corporate income tax for the purchase of zero and hybrid emission mobile machinery for use in the taxpayer's business or for rental or lease to the general public. You may recall hearing a similar, something similar to this last year as Maryland made changes to some programs for the purchase of, of zero emission vehicles and heavy equipment. However, those programs have limited funding, need to be reauthorized on a regular basis, and typically are on a first come, first serve basis. These programs do not provide the certainty needed for businesses to plan for the multi-year procurement of equipment. Contractors rent a majority of the equipment they use in construction. Providing a tax credit for the rental industry will help offset the significant upfront cost for zero emission fleet and facilitate the adoption of this equipment by contractors and other end users in Maryland by making it more competitive with comparable gas or diesel equipment. This bill will incentivize businesses to initiate the transition to a zero emission fleet. HB 1181 includes a sunset provision from December 31st, 2023 to December 31st, 2032. This follows the federal sunset dates and should be far enough out to where prices for zero emission mobile machinery are competitive. There are a few technical amendments to this bill that do the following. Number one, clarifies that an eligible taxpayer is a person that has a place of business in the state instead of their headquarters. Clarifies that an eligible taxpayer derives at least 51% of their annual revenue from the rental or lease of tangible personal property rather than just mobile machinery. This, these businesses rent all types of equipment, not just mobile equipment with an engine. For hybrid engines, the current language only includes gas or diesel engines. This amendment just adds uh, other fuels intended to, be, intended to be used in an internal combustion engine. This would include hydrogen, propane, natural gas, and other alternative fuels that have yet to be created. Uh, number four, removes additional requirements for zero emission mobile machinery and relies on the federal commercial clean vehicle program per 45W of the IRS code. I thank the committee for your time and urge your support uh, in passing HB 1181 with a favorable report. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, Madam Vice Chair, members of the committee, Natasha Mayu here with Manus Canning on behalf of United Rental in support of House Bill 1181. I wanna thank um, Delegate Vogel for sponsoring this bill on our behalf. Our goal here is to help advance the purchase of hybrid and zero emission construction vehicles. The bill aligns with the direction the state has been moving forward in when it comes to green um, energy, vehicles and equipment. These are new and developing um, technology, but especially when it comes to heavy construction equipment. And so you'll hear more from my client Ed Noonan at United Rental about the uncertainty and costs um, that companies face when it comes to purchasing, buying these equipment, um, and how this bill will help incentivize the companies to buy the equipment, and therefore um, will give um, the opportunity for customers to use the greener, more environmentally um, friendly equipment. 
Um, I do want to point out, um, as Delegate Vogel mentioned, that this bill does have a sunset. It recognizes that this incentive isn't forever, um, but it is to help to get the ball rolling. And so with that, I'll urge a favorable report, and I'll turn it over to um, Mr. Noonan. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, Madam Vice Chair, members of the committee. I'm Ed Noonan with the United Rentals. We are a large equipment rental company with a significant presence here in Maryland, operating from 20 locations and employing approximately 375 highly valued associates. I'm here today speaking in favor of HB 1181, both for my company and also for the American Rental Association, which we are a member of. Uh, they were planning to testify today and had a conflict, couldn't make it, but they did submit uh, written testimony for the record. Today, some in the rental industry are piloting or testing new zero emissions equipment. As with any new technology, the cost is high and the acceptance and adoption will take time and education. HB 1181 provides a tax credit for the purchase of zero emissions and hybrid mobile machinery. The bill also includes a sunset provision as was mentioned uh, by other members on the panel here. Um, and one thing I do want to point out, make a point here, the American Rental Association publishes an annual metric that estimates the amount of construction equipment that is owned by rental companies. The most recent report shows that today, approximately 55% of all construction equipment is owned by rental companies, not by contractors, not by individual businesses. Therefore, pro providing the tax credit to this industry makes perfect sense. The tax credit provided under HB 181 will help defray, defray some of the significant upfront costs of purchasing zero emission equipment and will make the rental of zero emission equipment more competitive with a comparable gas or diesel equipment. This in turn will provide a better opportunity for end users to rent and test out new zero emission fleet for use on their job sites. If we are serious about the transition to alternative and renewable fuel sourced equipment, then passing 1181 is a big step forward in achieving this goal. I urge your support in passing HB 1181. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, Vice Chair, members of the committee. Matthew Boley of Rifkin Wiener Livingston on behalf of Greenland Technologies Corporation and their heavy brand of all electric industrial equipment in support of the bill. This legislation will dr drive demand for lower and zero emission electric machinery. However, this legislation will not just help us stimulate demand for this equipment, it will also help us grow green manufacturing jobs in Maryland. As you will hear in detail from our next panelists, Raymond Wang, the CEO of Greenland Technologies and Heavy Core, Greenland is beginning to produce zero emission heavy equipment machinery right here in Maryland in Baltimore County. Greenland is producing electric loaders, excavators, and forklifts at this new facility. With that, I'll turn it over to Raymond Wang for further comment, and I urge a favorable report on this legislation. Thank you. Madam Chair, Vice Chair, and members of this committee, it is an honor to be speaking to you all today. My name is Raymond Wang, and I am the CEO of Greenland Technologies Corp. and our brand Heavy Corp., based out of White Marsh, Maryland, in District 8. We are a manufacturer of of all electric zero emission heavy equipment, such as loaders and excavators, up to 40,000 pounds. And I'm here in support of HB 1181. Replacing just one diesel machine with our electric alternative can reduce up to 200 tons of CO2 emissions per year on a single shift. That's the equivalent of converting six to eight transit buses or over 50 passenger cars away from fossil fuels to cleaner alternatives, such as electric. And our assembly site in White Marsh currently employs five employees, and we expect to create up to four dozen more green jobs for the local community as operations ramp up. And this bill will help support the adoption of our clean technology by rapidly deploying our equipment to work sites that only the rental industry can offer. This can contribute to a cleaner and healthier environment and accelerate our hiring strategy, creating more green jobs, manufacturing jobs for the local community. 
I thank this committee for your continued support and commitment to sustainability and building a better tomorrow for Maryland. Thank you very much. Thank you. Questions, Delegate Barnes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, and I just had a couple of questions because I'm trying to wrap my arms around the bill, especially when you look at the uh, the tax credit per machine that we're, we're talking about. And Mr. Wayne, you said you're in the manufacturing, correct? Yes. So how many of these machines do you manufacture every year uh, with an employee size of five? We just launched our product line. Our assembly site in White Marsh just went live uh, over the holidays last year. So we're just in the starting phase right now. Okay. So when you're just starting, so how many machines could you manufacture in a year? Once we ramp up this uh, White Marsh site, we expect to be able to roll off the line about 150 units per year. And as part of our strategy, we actually anticipate that we would have to deploy four assembly sites just to cover the Maryland area. Okay. And the gentleman over here, you said that 75% of the rental equipment comes from rental companies. How many rental companies are there in the state of Maryland? Uh, Delegate, uh, I think that number I said was 55%. Okay, uh, 75%. I'm gonna go with 50%. And I think the number uh, that you was provided, that 151 number, may be the actual rental locations, not necessarily the rental companies. And I will get you that information from the American Rental Association. And, provide that to you. And then uh, what is the cost of each machine? So our equipment range in cost from 135000 to 250000 with the battery and uh, base attachments. So with the, the uh, tax credit, how much of that would be offset by the tax credit? Uh, depending on the uh, vehicle size, it can cover up to 10% of our equipment cost. So roughly 10%. And, and are you the only manufacturer in the state of Maryland? Yes, we actually are the only manufacturer in the United States that makes this product commercially available, and we're doing it right here in Maryland. So you stand to capitalize a lot. Mm -hmm. Yes. No other questions. Thank you. Delegate Long. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Where are you located in White Marsh? I'm just curious where you lo relocate. Yep. Uh, we're just off Nottingham Drive. Uh, we are behind the Volvo dealership and share one of the uh, parking lots with the many Amazons. <laughs> they popped up overnight. Okay, what exactly kind of machinery do you build? I, I yep. might have missed it, but I'm uh, yep. just curious what type of So uh, we have two all-electric wheel loaders ranging in size from 12,000 pounds to 40,000 pounds and one wheeled all-electric excavator that weighs about 20,000 pounds. When you say wheel uh, loader, are you talking about uh, like a forklift? Uh, a more of a, a push and grading uh, loader uh, with a big bucket in front and uh, cabbed operation. Uh, typically utilized for... Uh, both uh, ground leveling and also for lifting operations such as salt into plows or material into hoppers. And what was the other one? I'm sorry, the other? Uh, it's a digging machine and excavator. Uh, just curious, like a backhoe? Uh, yes, yes. And I have to ask this question. I used to mess with them. Um, how long do they actually last with these batteries? Are they, what's the operating parameters? Yeah. The life of the batteries is, is expected to be tw uh, 10 to 12 years. We source our batteries from uh, CATL, the same batteries in the Tesla, GM, and Ford, and that's what gives it its um, uh, durability and power. Right. And the batteries are warranted for five years. Right. One last question. How do you charge these batteries on a work site? Yeah. So not only are, is our equipment suitable for the DCFC fast charging network, but we've also developed mobile chargers that supports inputs from 220 volts to 480 volt power, and that can be utilized to charge our equipment similar to your laptops. When you say mobile, are you talking about generator as far as uh, like a, a generator? Uh, uh, no, it'll be units uh, ranging in size from a briefcase to a carry-on that can be uh, universal across our entire equipment line that can plug into any site that has that power structure with um, a non-proprietary standard plug, whether it's 220 uh, volt or 480 volt, and they can charge our equipment as fast as up to uh, four to six hours. Thank you. All right, seeing no other questions, that ends the hearing on this bill. Thank you, Delegate Vogel. Now calling HB 925, Delegate Buckle. And we have for your panel 
Well, these are favored with amendments, so would you like us to hold on bringing them up? Uh, no, that's fine. Okay, Dr. Alicia Spore and Melissa Segev. You scared them off, Madam Vice Chair. <laughs> no amendments now, I guess. <laughs> uh, thank you, Madam Vice Chair, members of the committee. Uh, uh, Delegate Jason Buck will presenting House Bill 925. Uh, as all you well know, we are confronted uh, every week with a variety of proposals to cut taxes, to provide tax credits, to provide sales tax exemptions and other things. Until I heard Delegate Barnes' bill today, which obviously you could tell meant a great deal to me, I thought that my bill probably had the most resonant uh, personal impact just on regular folks as opposed to business or other policy considerations. Uh, but I think this is still an important bill. What the bill does several years ago, we passed legislation that included sales tax exemption for certain hearing aid or hearing aid components uh, so that people, that, as you can see from the fiscal note, the average cost of hearing aids is around $4,700. Uh, hearing aids are something that becomes ubiquitous both for our elderly and also for those who have uh, hearing disabilities that from, from a very young age, sometimes even from birth, uh, require hearing aids and, and these other devices so as to enable, the, enable them to participate fully in what many of us take for granted. And so we'd like to provide some sales tax exemptions for those class of deserving individuals. What this bill does, because the hearing aid technologies uh, and systems continue to evolve and there have been always certain very restrictive uh, definitions from the comptroller and other relevant agencies as to what the sales tax exemption applies to, what this bill does is it just sort of more broadly defines and says that the sales and use tax exemption for hearing aids would also apply to things like custom-made in-ear uh, musician monitors, hearing aid supplies, or hearing aid accessories. Uh, you may be able, rather than to spend the $4,700 to purchase a brand new hearing aid every time, you may be able to purchase uh, accessories or components to that hearing aid so that it continues to work and provide you the services necessary and it would be a good matter of public policy to continue to extend that sales tax exemption to those components, supplies, or accessories, and not say, well, you can get it when you buy the first device, but then when you try to, to keep your device uh, sort of up to speed, up to date, and you may need a replacement part, we don't provide you the sales and use tax exemption on that. Uh, I think, as we see with many of the fiscal notes, the fiscal impact is... Uh, uh, not really terribly well defined, but I would suggest to you that the existing exemption <clears throat> has not produced any significant fiscal effects such that it would have a, a real budgetary impact. It's probably a fairly small uh, element of things, 6% of the supplies and the hearing aids accessories as the uh, technology continues to evolve. The audiology community and others are, are extremely excited about the bill because Sometimes people don't get hearing aids because it's simply outside of their financial means to do so. And any way that we could provide them with a small incentive or a small break would assist in uh, enabling people to get this technology uh, and services that they need uh, to meet their hearing needs. So with that, uh, I hope that the bill uh, gets a favorable report by the committee in consideration through our process. Thank you, Delegate Buckle. Any questions for Delegate Buckle? Oh. Delegate Hornberger. Thank you can ask me chair. at the House later, but no, sure. Uh, no, I, I think this is a good bill, and I just wanted to have uh, on the record here. There are some bills that I think opt this into Medicaid, Medicare. Uh, so that would that would also significantly decrease the cost. Uh, have you talked to the sponsors of those bills? Or is that something you're interested in? I, I, I haven't. I certainly think that that would be fine. It's sometimes difficult. I mean, we I don't think we as a state legislature can redefine Medicare, uh, what Medicare will pay for. We can sometimes define what our state portion, our state regulations with respect to Medicaid, right. uh, which, of course, Medicaid would generally only relate to uh, individuals who are already within the program, so you're leaving out a lot of middle class folks and, and elderly folks who are not Medicaid eligible. But anything that can be done to help uh, make the purchase of these very important devices, uh, much as we talked about with AEDs and other things, that can make it more cost feasible, I think is a, is a worthy use of our uh, tax dollars. All right, thank you. Good bill. Any other questions? Seeing none, thank you, Delegate thank Buckle. You. I will just call the favor with amendments once more, see if they're here. Dr. Alicia Spore and Melissa Segev. Okay. 
amendments after all, Dr. B Dr. Buckle. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Madam Chair Atterbury, Madam Chair Vice, uh, Vice well, Chair, sorry, Madam Vice Chair Wilkins and committee members. My name is Melissa Segev and I am a second generation licensed audiologist and small business owner of one of the largest and oldest private practices in the state of Maryland. On behalf of the Maryland Academy of Audiology, I am pleased to be working to expand the list of sales and tax exemptions to include certain hearing aid batteries, transmitters, receivers, systems, in-ear monitors, supplies, and accessories. Hearing aids, hearing aid batteries, and replacement cords for a hearing aid have been tax exempt for my entire professional career. In 2020, delegates Buckle and Lukey modernized the tax exemption list to remove items that are not used with today's modern hearing aid technologies and began updating the most common items that are required for a hearing aid to function. When enacted, HB 925 would revise the list of tax-exempt items to include batteries and battery chargers, hearing aid supplies required for non-surgical air conduction hearing aids to function appropriately every day. Hearing aid batteries are one of the four basic components of a hearing aid, which are required for the device to function. Patients should have the ability to choose the option of disposable or rechargeable batteries for their lifestyle and have the same tax-exempt status when purchasing disposable or battery charger, respectively. In my practice, rechargeable batteries are currently the norm. However, some patients still benefit from disposable batteries. Additionally, with the advancements of today's technology, there are supplies that are required and recommended to guarantee optimal results for the wearer. These supplies are specific to non-surgical air conduction hearing aids and can be proprietary to the hearing aid manufacturers. There are devices, supplies that are replaced at regular intervals to enhance the sound quality um, and longevity of hearing aids, and furthermore, they prevent infection. As an audiologist, I followed in my father's footsteps to improve quality of life for patients in the area of hearing health care, which often requires treatment via hearing aids for hearing loss. The Maryland tax code should be updated to tax exempt for the batteries, battery chargers, and supplies consistent with today's technology to benefit my patients and your constituents. Thank you for your time and consideration and to the delegates who originally sponsored the introduction, and I ask for a favorable committee report on HB 925. Thank you, Madam Chair Atterbury, Madam Vice Chair Wilkins, and committee members. This will teach us to sit outside while we're not talking during your committee hearing. My name is Alicia Spohr, and I am a licensed Maryland audiologist and small business owner in Howard County. I am also the current legislative chair for the Maryland Academy of Audiology, who represents more than 525 licensed audiologists in the state of Maryland. As you heard from my colleague, H-Bill 925 would expand the tax-exempt list to include FM systems, wireless hearing aid accessories, and custom-made in-ear monitors. Non-surgical prescription hearing aid users improve users' quality of life, but occasionally patients need more help. An FM system reduces background noise to help clarify a speaker's voice and are especially helpful in classroom settings much like this one. Hearing aid accessories are medical devices that are purchased from the same hearing aid manufacturers to help listeners in specific environments like listening to the television. In-ear monitors are used by audiophiles to protect their hearing and prevent occupational noise-induced hearing loss. While all these devices are not required for every hearing aid user or recreational musician, they can be essential to success in each required environment when they are necessary. FM systems, hearing aid accessories, and in-ear monitors are specialized medical devices and fit by licensed audiologists and hearing aid dispensers. There are two amendments that I'd like to highlight. First, to strike the words for a hearing aid on page 2, line 23, as this was already exempt with Delegates Buckle and Lukey's successful legislation in 2020. The legislation would then simply read custom-made ear molds. Second, to grammatically change hearing aid supply to the plural form of hearing aid supplies on page 2, line 18, 22, and 28. I agree with delegates' comments around the fiscal note and additionally report that there are only a 1,000 licensed audiologists or dispensers that this legislation would affect. Thank you for your time and consideration to help your constituents who will benefit from this modest attempt to make accessories and supplies more affordable. I ask for your favorable committee report with amendments on HB 925. Thank you so much. Any questions for this panel? 
Can, can I make one quick comment to Delegate um, Hornberger's questions around you, Medicare and Medicaid? Do you want to re-ask your question? Okay. All right. We can, we'll allow that. Thank you. I'd just like to make the comment that Medicare does not currently cover anything towards the cost of a hearing aid for any individual. Therefore, when you're talking to Medicare constituents, everything that they're paying for around the hearing aid is currently out of pocket. So that tax exempt status would not currently apply to that Medicare population. Medicaid, yes, but Medicare, no. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for the clarification. All right, seeing no other questions, that's it for our in-person witnesses, but I do believe we have one virtual favorable with amendment, Shruti Kulkarni. Hi, can you hear me? Perfect, thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Shruti Kulkarni. I represent Miracle Year, a leading provider, a leading hearing aid provider with 18 offices in Maryland. We support HB 925 with amendments, which would expand the list of tax exempt items with regards to hearing aids to include, among other things, custom made ear mold, battery or battery charger, frequency modulated transmitter and receiver, hearing aid supplies, which are items that are essential to the function of the hearing aid, as well as hearing aid accessories. Hearing aids have been tax exempt for decades. However, as of 2020, Maryland started modernizing the tax exempt list to only include items that are used with today's modern hearing aid technology. HB 925 includes items that are the basic components required for the functioning of a hearing aid, such as batteries, battery charger, hearing aid supplies, or items that are highly recommended to ensure that a hearing aid functions in its optimal capacity, such as custom ear mold, frequency modulated transmitter and receiver, and hearing aid accessories. As such, these items are consistently used with today's modern hearing aid technology, and this bill would benefit seniors in Maryland who need access to these items. Therefore, we urge this committee to rule favorably towards HB 925 with amendments. Thank you. Thank you so much. Any questions for this witness? Seeing none, thank you again for your testimony. That ends the hearing on HB 925. Now calling up HB 1152, Delegate Chisholm, the Entrepreneurial Equity Act. And we do have colleagues from ECM who are joining us for this hearing. Right now we have Delegate Pippi and I believe Delegate Chi and Delegate Queen may also be joining us. You're good. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. It must be my lucky day I finally escaped Health and government operations and delegate buckle decides to bring a Medicaid and hearing aid bill. I appreciate that. Yeah. For the record, I'm Delegate Brian Chisholm here to present HB 1152, the Right to Start Act. The Right to Start Act uh, is a step forward for Maryland entrepreneurs to pursue their dream of building their own business, earn a living, and the bill seeks to unleash that entrepreneurial spirit in all of us. Um, Statistics tell us that everybody in this room, if I were to say it right now, if you think about it, think about that business you've always dreamt of. You already have it in your mind. Most people do it. 62% of all people have a business that they've always wanted to start. Unfortunately, only 2% have actually, actually tried to do it. 41% tell us they won't start it because of some of the costs because we make it so difficult. Everyone has great ideas. Very few act upon them. This bill seeks to alleviate some of those fears and some of those costs. HB 152 just asked to waive the initial fees and registrations for new businesses, including home-based businesses. It is a way to help spread prosperity have homegrown jobs, higher incomes, stronger communities, lower inequality, and less poverty. Communities can be transformed by small businesses. We see it every day. It is vital to bringing some of these communities up. Furthermore, 
It helps these small businesses that are just starting up get a seat at the procurement table. Yesterday was procurement day in health and government operations. It's that one day a year where I get to reunite with my good buddy, Nick Charles, and hear about all the problems in procurement. But I appreciate everything that he's done because I know how frustrating it can be. This bill asks that 10% of all procurement contracts are designated for small businesses that have opened up in the last five years. Not only should, on top of that, we do know, and I've brought this up on the House floor, that the state of Maryland should be proud of one thing. We are number one in the country for minority and women-owned businesses. We have 10% of our businesses are veteran-owned. We should be proud of that. We should be doing everything we can to lift these businesses up and encourage entrepreneurship for people that have always wanted a business, but for either cost prohibit because of the cost prohibited or the, all of the regulations that we put and the barriers we put in front of these businesses, do not do it. We all stood there and watched the inauguration of Governor Moore. And he, he said something that I have 100% agreement with him on. Not every kid in the state of Maryland needs to go to a four-year school. Matter of fact, it's bad for some kids. But we do know there is a lot of Maryland youth that want to start their own business, whether it's in a trade, and these trades are what we need. So we need to do everything we can to remove some of those barriers. I'm gonna make them my star today. This was in the Baltimore Sun two days ago. It's a quote, MBEs have played a vital role in the state's economy, yet they continue to face significant barriers to success. Delegate Nick Charles. More, other officials seek more contracts for minority businesses. These are the small businesses we're talking about. These new startups, the, the ones that want a seat at the table. I am sure that if you ask anybody that has had frustrations getting to the procurement table, they will tell you the same thing. It's the good old boy network. Once they're in, they got their shoe in, and they would do everything possible to push out small businesses. We have to make an effort to stop that. So the people that are starting small businesses and these small businesses have an opportunity to prove that they can fulfill some of these state contracts. What are the biggest challenges? 20% of all small businesses fail within the first year, 50% within the first year because of high startup costs, higher inflation, labor shortages, and that is the reason why I think this bill is so vital. It is to churn that economic engine. All of us get to do something as bipartisan groups often, and that is ribbon cuttings. I think it's one of the, the best things that we get to do because you get to see that, that excitement in somebody's eye who is cutting a ribbon and opening a business for the first time because it's tough to do. It's a challenge, but it is what we desperately need in order to solve a lot of this state's problems is to continue to encourage entrepreneurship and give everybody a shot at becoming a successful small business in the state of Maryland. With that, Madam Vice Chair, I ask for a favorable report on HB 1152, and I'll now turn it over to Gretchen. Thank you, Delegate Chisholm. Uh, thank you as well, Madam Vice Chair and members of the Ways and Means Committee. My name is Gretchen Baldau, and I am the Director of the Commerce, Insurance, and Economic Development Task Force at the American Legislative Exchange Council. One of the CID's uh, task force's main goals is to identify and promote nonpartisan policies that help state economies grow, and I am here today to speak about the pro-growth policies contained in HB 1152. I would like to begin by noting a few things. First, that new, business, that new businesses generate almost all net growth creation in America. Second, that 44% of America's economic activity is generated by small businesses each year. Third, that entrepreneurship in America has until recently been in a decline. From 1978 to 2019, 
only 9% of all American firms each year were new firms. New business application rates are rising, but as recently as 2022, 69% of American entrepreneurs stated that they believe that government does not care about them. Of these same entrepreneurs, 81% also stated that they believe government incentives favor existing businesses over startups. Put another way, entrepreneurs feel that in opening a business, their new business is not only swimming upstream against the competitors, but also the government. The policies in HB 1152 are an olive branch to Maryland's new or would-be entrepreneurs. With reforms like waiving new business filing and registration fees and requiring 10% of different business and workforce development funding to be allocated to new business-related organizations and programs, the policies in HB 1152 send a clear message that state government wants job creators and new entrepreneurs to be successful in Maryland. I would like to end by noting that Alex CIED Task Force, which is comprised of over 350 state legislators and private sector groups, approved a similarly aimed model policy just last year. Like Maryland's HB 1152, Alex's Right to Start Act also proposes policies that give new business owners a helping hand. Thank you for allowing me to share this information today. <clears throat> All right, move on. Hi, yes, um, good afternoon, uh, Madam Chairman and committee. My name is Dawn Pulliam. I, am born, I was born and raised in Prince George's County, Maryland, and now moved to Anne Arundel County in the last 15 years. Um, I'm not here on behalf of any organization. I'm here on behalf of other citizens, and this is my heart. So we're gonna speak heart to heart here. Um, I spent 23 years of my uh, career working at the University of Maryland. Economic development was what I did. And just like Delegate Chisholm mentioned, the good old boy network and the processes, I spent every day learning your processes from the local, state, federal, and defense level so I could help those who could not start a small business. This is very serious. We have a lot of people out there who want to start a small business, have what it takes, but it is very hard to mitigate through those systems. Um, today, I want to thank, uh, I thank you. I think you changed the name of the bill, but the, entre um, the bill that what I read was the um, equ entrepreneurial equity. This is not, par this is not uh, partisan. This is bipartisan. I spent a lot of my time in the minority communities helping them, just like last weekend, helping them figure out these systems. Um, with, with the darkness that we have with our economy in this nation, we have schedule issues, we have, um, we have the economy in general, we have childcare issues, crime, opportunities for big box stores that are coming in because we can't get these small businesses started. But with dark, there is light. We can use these, uh, this legislation to strengthen our fabric of our community um, and, and other incentives encourage, to encourage helping with our crime, help reduce crime, um, and we can give back to our community. Um, the, offset, the, the offset of the waivers will be great because it gives them money in their pocket. And lastly, procurement. It'll help the rest of the state, uh, everything we're doing on other levels. So thank you. Thank you, Delegate, and thank you so much for the witnesses for testifying. Are there any questions from members? Seeing no questions, this panel can be dismissed, but we do, I think, have a one person in the waiting room virtually. Jason Grill, you can go ahead and start. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thank you so much, everyone. Jason Grill with Right to Start, nonprofit working to expand entrepreneurial opportunity. A lot of things have already been said today, but I want to um, reiterate many of them that net new businesses create the most jobs in our economy. Um, we grow stronger G GDP through them. We increase homegrown jobs and community wealth, as well as alleviate poverty. Um, as we mentioned earlier, startups are in decline in our country, however, uh, that hasn't hurt the entrepreneurial DNA of the United States. 94% of voters nearly unanimously across party lines say it's important for America's future to help young companies and give opportunities and citizens a fair opportunity to start and grow their own business. However, 92% of voters say that starting a new business today is difficult or very difficult. 
I want to just uh, focus on a couple key things that if anything gets through here, I think are the most important. Uh, tracking of data is so important. If you're not tracking data, you're just practicing, you're not in the game. And tracking of government contracts for new and young businesses under five years old is just such a paramount thing that the state of Maryland could be doing. It'll let you know how many young companies and startups are actually engaged with the government and how many government contracts are going to them. Um, you can reach 5%, 10%, through many different ways that don't only include set-asides and quotas. You can reach them through um, doing such thing as reducing time for payments for entrepreneurs, through more marketing and outreach of the programs you have in your state, through prioritizing innovation as a selection factor, through measuring past performance based on non-state customers and for, for, by providing training and education. There's so many ways to get up to five to 10% and how you can encourage that is very important. Uh, I'll leave you in my last 18 seconds with letting you know that the United States has a uh, average cost of $725 to start a business. This is way higher than Canada, China, Denmark, Chile, Ireland, Brazil, to name a few. Waiving a first year business fee for a startup lets them start so much easier. Um, I'd, I'd really appreciate your support uh, and I fully support this bill on behalf of entrepreneurs and young businesses throughout the country and I'm excited that Maryland is moving forward on this. Thank you so much for your testimony. Any questions for this witness? All right, seeing none, thank you so much, Mr. Grill. Have a good rest of the day. Now for our final bill of the day, Delegate Henson, HB 965, and thank you, Delegate Pippi, for joining us in Ways and Means today. Thank you, Madam Chair. May I call up my panel as well? Yes, please. I have Zephyr Shaw, Ryan Washington, and Bill Castell. Thank you. And may I begin? Thank you. I am Delegate Shanika Henson, for the record, here to present House Bill 965. This is a bill to provide a tax credit for landlords that undertake rental property mold, mold remediation and rental properties. We know that exposure to mold can cause upper respiratory tract illnesses, coughing, wheezing, they can exacerbate asthma, and that the risk of mold is even higher for children, the elderly, and the immunocompromised. We have, um, I have a separate set of bills um, designed to attack mold in rental properties through the rent escrow process, to enforce mold through other civil remedies. But for this bill, we want to incentivize landlords to undertake the work of remediation. <laughs> We understand that that work can be costly, so we want to make sure that on the back side of that, that there is the proper incentive for the <laughs> landlord. The structure of the bill is, is that it would create a tax credit. The maximum allowance of the tax credit for a project would be $10,000. The total budget for the program would be $600,000. So it is a first come, first serve tax credit that the landlord would apply for. We want to make sure that it's equitable opportunities between landlords that own single family residences and our multifamily landlords. So 40% of the total program budget could go to single family residences and 60% would be allotted for multifamily residences. This tax credit is non-refundable. So if the landlord does engage in the work and they wanna offset their tax liability, this bill would give them the ability to do that, but it is non-refundable um, if they don't have a tax liability that exceeds the amount. The bill also requires an annual report to be generated so that we can track and monitor the usefulness of this program. And the tax credit does sunset after 10 years as well so that we can evaluate it as a general assembly to determine if this is something we want to continue. That is the structure of the bill and I appreciate your consideration and ask for a favorable report. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you members of the committee for having me and thank you Delegate Henson for inviting uh, Maryland Legal Aid uh, to testify on this bill. My name is Zephyr Shah. I'm the Assistant Director of Advocacy for Access to Counsel and Evictions uh, at Maryland Legal Aid. We provide legal uh, advice and representation to thousands of low-income renter households throughout the state of Maryland. Um, and in whether it's an eviction case or a case involving substandard housing conditions, our clients, for them, top of mind uh, is mold. And, and the lack of... Um, well, the the addition, the burden, uh, both on their family as well as the property owner, 
to undertake uh, serious uh, mold remediation. Um, in Maryland, in 2021, uh, the Ho American Housing Survey estimated that 94,000 rental properties were affected by interior water leakage, 74,000 by exterior water leakage. Um, the survey estimated that 38,000 rental properties were affected by mold. And so we know that the scale of this problem requires multiple policy interventions. Um, at Maryland Legal Aid, we often stand in support of legislation that would strengthen renters' legal remedies uh, against their landlord to hold them accountable for substandard conditions. But we recognize the importance of financial incentives and the reality that many landlords are in a financial position to have to depend on deferred maintenance even when there's a serious mold problem. And so House Bill 965 provides a needed financial incentive and measure of financial relief for these landlords to undertake mold remediation. And so by, uh, we, we are here today and it's unusual to be on a, a favorable panel with uh, our industry friends, but by, by helping these property owners, we're helping low income tenants. We urge your favorable report. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee, Bill Castelli on behalf of the Maryland Realtors. And uh, our members uh, often represent uh, property managers, many of them who are managing single family properties for what many would consider kind of mom and pop landlords. And uh, as the panel has discussed already, yeah, mold remediation can be very expensive. Uh, many rental programs who do inspections when you're getting your rental license will will actually look at the condition of the property. And if there is mold on the property and it is a significant problem on the property, you will have to remediate it. Um, it could be hundreds of dollars if it's a small apartment in a very, very small um, uh, contained area. And it can be tens of thousands of dollars if it's a single family home and you've got to essentially uh, rip out walls, ceilings, and everything else in the basement. So this is a very expensive process. Uh, this is a very targeted relief program. Would we love it to be bigger and grander? Absolutely, but we recognize that this would be a very targeted approach to get this program off the ground and give some assistance to those uh, landlords who are already bearing uh, some of these expenses. Uh, so we would encourage a favorable report. Good afternoon, uh, Madam Vice Chair, members of the committee. My name is Ryan Washington. I represent the Apartment Office Building Association in Metropolitan Washington. Uh, we represent uh, property management companies uh, that represent a total of 133,000 rental units across Montgomery and Prince George's counties. Uh, I would just like to echo just the sentiments of my colleagues on this table. Uh, this bill is perfect for offsetting the cost that many of our housing providers experience. Uh, also, I just got some data from one of our member properties. Out of a portfolio of 2,969 apartment homes, they currently carry a total rent delinquency of $2.6 million. Um, so just putting that into perspective, uh, this tax credit bill will really help out a lot of those members that are in a hole uh, with rent delinquencies and trying to make abatements and staying on top of their uh, rental housing codes. Thank you, and I'll stay for any questions. Thank you so much to this panel, and thank you, Delegate, for bringing this bill. I will go with the first question. Not sure if there are any others. I can see, Delegate, that this bill is extremely well thought out, especially it not being refundable and it really being for the amount of the cost that is incurred. But my question for your panel, especially the folks who are representing the property management individuals, I can definitely see for the smaller and um, single family home um, and taxpayers, as you call them, in the bill, that the cost of this would be really exponential and very challenging, especially for the smaller landlords. But for the larger ones who are charging excessive and, as we know, growing rents, I wanted to better understand why um, we should cover the cost of maybe what they should already be doing and perhaps with their margins might be able to cover the cost of. That's a great question, Delegate. And just to clarify, you're explaining what would the benefit be for larger property management companies, essentially? 
Not that there, not that the, the, I understand what the benefit would be, but why we should use utilize, utilize state dollars for these the larger ones, especially where we're seeing excessively high rents and particularly high higher profit margins. Why we should, as a state, cover the cost of the mold re remediation, which they should definitely be doing for the health of the residents who are staying there. Absolutely, and this is not this is a bill that helps out with cost that rising cost of labor. Uh, because when you're going in a single unit, depending on the mold remediation and this the, the type of fungal strain that is afflicting that specific unit, it could cost you know a couple thousand to remove it. And you're talking about one unit. So adding all those costs up for properties that uh, have may have mold issues can 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 be costly on top of you know issues with rent delinquencies. Um, and none of our members are in the position of wanting to not provide safe and habitable housing for tenants. Uh, that's not the case for many folks. Um, but I would say that this benefit would help. It, it's with the rise of cost and labor. It, this is one of those bills that would just help offset those expenses uh, and help them to operate. If that answers your question. What about the larger? Is there any differentiation between the larger property owners? and the ones who are smaller who may really need and benefit more from those um, from those benefits of this tax credit? May I answer that, Madam Chair? Yes. Thank you. The bill, it sequesters the money, 60% for the multifamilies and 40% for the single family properties in an attempt to make sure that there is equitable opportunity there. There could be a difference in technical support when applying for the benefit. So we wanna make sure that we leave some money for our single families and our smaller landlords as well. Okay, thank you, Delegate. We can talk more offline. Thank you so much to this panel. Delegate Long with a question. Thank you, Madam Chair. My question is, when you see multifamily dwellings, do you have a number of multifamily, uh, would you say it'd be one, I mean, two units, three units? Is there a limit to how many units would be in a multifamily dwelling? I don't think there is a unit. Um, you know, multifamily apartment communities may encompass, you know, garden style communities, uh, 20 or more units, uh, essentially as defined. So I I'm just trying to clarify. So you're saying you're going to, uh, give more money to uh, some of the bigger companies that have larger units, such as no, that that's not my question. No, no uh, that was a question I was asking. Uh oh, I can answer it. Oh, the multifamily is anything more than one. So if you have what looks like a home, but it's subdivided mm -hmm. into multiple apartment units, then that's a multifamily unit. And the way that the program budget breaks down is 40% would be for single family units and 60% for multifamily, but the cap is 10,000. So they wouldn't be able to get more necessarily because they have a multifamily unit unless they are undergoing more remediation efforts. Right. Would you have an objection to maybe amend this bill to only two units? I don't understand. Of, um, oh, I understand what you're saying, yeah. to amend it so that if a landlord owns or possesses more than two units, they could no, no, not no, get the not, benefit? One building has more than two units, in, in other words, two units or less. Because what I'm, what I'm hearing, and maybe I'm wrong, so correct me if I'm wrong, if a garden-style apartment has a problem, they would be entitled to this, this tax credit. Yeah, Am but I not, correct? but if, if, but this unit, if, so if we're in a multifamily unit, apartment community, if one unit is affected, you, they still wouldn't be, so what you're saying, they wouldn't be able to, if one unit out of, let's say, 500 is aff affected by mold, and they try to participate in this program, you're saying that they wouldn't be able to under this? It would only be limited to one or two? I'm kind of confused. No, one, let me clarify. You have a house, row home, whatever it is, row home, um, individual, and a max, it has two units in it. That's, I, that's what I consider multifamily dwelling. And that's what I would foresee where this help would come in. Mm -hmm. When you talk about multifamily, and this is what I was trying to clarify. Are you talking about like the garden style apartments? Let's say if you only have one unit, but you had 20 units around it, you know, that's a pretty big uh, so mul ownership. Multifamily speaks to the number of units in the portfolio, not necessarily the number of 
families or units behind the door. So if you have a home that's subdivided and it's not just one apartment or one rental, then that's multifamily. That could be just one building with multiple apartments, mm -hmm. or it could be an entire community with many different units. That's what I was asking. Was it was it more than like multi units, like in one community? Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, uh, um, Delga Henson, for this bill. Um, so uh, to, to add on to Delegate Long's line of questioning, I'm not seeing how um, a condo owner who rents out this his or her space benefits. I'm not seeing how a townhome owner rents out his or her space and benefits. Can you clarify whether those people will be benefiting from this bill? Yes. Mm -hmm. So in the instance of a townhome, that's treated as a single family okay. if you have one individual who is renting that out. If you have a condo and you have one individual who is renting that out, I would say under the bill that would still qualify in the bucket of multifamily because of the structure of the common elements and there being more than one in a particular building. Okay, I guess that's where I'm confused because I, I, I'm understanding the multifamily dwelling benefit. It sounds like it benefits the company that owns the unit of more than one more than one unit in a building, but if you have a condos, condos where you have a bunch of people owning different properties in this one unit, it's just not clear to me. Because when I hear multifamily, I don't think condominiums. I think apartments. So maybe that's just something to think about as we're going through the process of looking at the um, any potential amendments, just to clarify that definition. But, um, but yeah, it's a, it's a good bill otherwise, thanks. I appreciate the question. Thank sure. you. Sure. Any other questions? All right, seeing none, we actually, this panel is excused, but it looks like we do have one virtual witness. Thank you. Colin or Colin Choney. You can go ahead. Uh, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Madam Chairman and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Colin Choney, and I am the Housing Rehabilitation Director with Green and Healthy Homes Initiative. And I'm offering this testimony on behalf of the organization and our president and CEO, Ruth Ann Norton. Uh, the Green and Healthy Homes Initiative writes in support of House Bill 965. Uh, Green and Healthy Homes Initiative has a longstanding history of advocating for families and children on the important issue of lead poisoning prevention and addressing healthy home hazards such as mold. Across the state of Maryland, GHHI provides healthy homes education and direct housing intervention services to reduce triggers that cause asthma episodes and other respiratory issues in homes for children, adults, and seniors. The, sen uh, the Center for Disease Control and Prevention defines mold as a fungus that can be found indoors and outdoors. Mold is most commonly found indoors in damp areas with poor ventilation, such as bathrooms and basements. Mold exposure can cause or exacerbate many health issues such as asthma, upper respiratory conditions, and COPD. The presence of mold is a well-established trigger of asthma episodes and contributes to other negative health conditions. Mold is a threat to life, health, and safety and occurs through the poor or inadequate ventilation, leaking roofs, water infiltration, missing gutters and downspouts, faulty plumbing, and other conditions in rental homes that cause mold growth. Over 500,000 children and adults in Maryland have been diagnosed with asthma. Asthma is the number one reason children miss days from schools, and mold is a major trigger in homes. The social cost directly correlates to 14.4 missed school days, and it costs the state of Maryland $42. million annually for asthma-related hospitalizations if you could and $93.3 million. Your last thought. Sorry about that. You can wrap up your last thought. Yeah, and I just wanted to emphasize the cost that um, asthma and mold causes the state of Maryland, um, $42.1 million annually for asthma-related hospitalizations and $93.3 million for asthma-related emergency department visits. 
and we request a favorable support uh, report for House Bill 965. Thank you so much. We appreciate your testimony. Any questions for this witness? All right, thank you, Delegate Henson. This ends the bill hearing of HB 965, and it ends the bill hearings for the day. Colleagues, we will meet to vote in 20 minutes at 4 o'clock.